Hello and welcome back to my channel, Deku Fanfic. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the second part of our series, What If Abande and Deku Got Harim? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Lest at 719 from fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. The time seemed to fly, and Izuku continued his training and therapy. The beach was cleaned, and he got to meet and get to know Mei. He tendered his resignations from the enchanted forest and oddities, though oddities told him that if Yue would allow it, he was welcome to return. He invested all he could into stocks, he realized that Warren had been possibly the most helpful with worldly things. He was happy to hear that Kara's daughter was going to Yue. As well, he promised to look after her should they meet. Melissa arrived soon as she prepared for her test for the support department course at Yue. It was fun to see them all interact. Thanks to the information buried in his head, he could follow along with the conversations involving their inventions and even provide some help. He was helping May move things around her workshop when he noticed the girls looking at him and whispering to Momo, who was blushing furiously. He noticed that Jean was cramming more into him than average. He could sense it, a deadline was coming. She didn't say anything specific, but she was being more attentive to him and constantly drilling him with scenarios. He packed up most of the apartment. He sold off all his remaining parent items. He awoke the morning of the exam excited. He grabbed his bag and headed off to Yue. Walking up to the gates, he saw Momo, Mei, and Melissa standing there. Momo hugged them all, wishing them luck. She gently kissed Izuku for luck. Give me your key, she said with a blush. Okay, can I ask why? I will be waiting for you when you get home so we can celebrate. Oh, that sounds nice. Momo gathered her courage, she leaned in and whispered. I don't need to go home till tomorrow. Izuku stopped functioning, Momo fled, and Mei and Melissa snapped pictures before he reset. Once he did, Melissa grabbed him by his arm. Come on, lover boy, I am sure Momo will be upset if you don't even take the test. Jean cackled. They ensured he signed him before heading to the support course testing area. Izuku. As he was walking down the hall, he saw All Might JR, directing others where to go. When he saw Izuku, he walked over. Need any help there? Nah, I'm good. Where's your boss? Izuku said. Being a hero. Don't worry, I'm here as a soon-to-be third year to help wayward examinees find their destinations. He said with a smile. Good to know. See you around. Izuku said, stepping past him. Bet on it, he called after him. He entered his exam area and found it nearly full, he immediately noticed Bakugo. Fortunately, he didn't have to sit near him. They stared at each other for a moment. He took his seat, the instructor announced as the test packets were handed out. You have three hours and 125 questions, no talking, you can leave when you finish. Your time starts now. Now Izuku had studied, and now he could have studied more but, like any teen, with the option of studying or messing around with his girlfriend. He made the wise decision and messed around. This test, on the other hand, was intense. He had to draw on all kinds of knowledge. What did mechanical engineering have to do with this? Moral questions, high-level math, science, combat, law, and even a question on genetics. Many questions were not typically covered in study guides or in most high schools. If it weren't the wellspring of knowledge in his head that he could access, he would be fucked. They are fucking with you. None of the other's tests are anything like yours. Someone is up to something. Izuku finished with two minutes left to spare. As he exited the room, he saw the instructor immediately place his test in an envelope. He quickly scanned the man's mind. The man was to send the test to be graded immediately, he didn't know why. Izuku went to the locker room and got changed. He entered the auditorium and, took a seat, started reading over the information. Present Mike took the stage. Hey all, let me get a hey. Silence. Tough crowd. Now all of you have your information regarding the, your practical exams. After this presentation, you will go to your assigned testing grounds where you will participate in a mock battle. Your villains are four different types of robots. Excuse me, sir. Yes, examine 7717. Izuku turned and looked at the young man, tall, fit, with glasses and blue hair. Only three robots are listed in the information packet. I find it highly unlikely that such an esteemed academy like UA would commit such a blunder. And you, with the spiky blonde hair, have been cursing and causing a popping sound the entire time. If you are just here to cause distraction, you should leave. What the fuck did you say four eyes? Back Hugo yelled. Now, now, language students, but yes, 7717, you are correct, the fourth villain is an obstacle and is worth no points, more to be avoided. Now, kids, it is time to go plus. Ultra, the crowd responded. The practical exam. Izuku stood and walked to the bus to take him to his testing area. He saw a girl with pink skin and horns. That is Kara's daughter Mina, having seen photos of her several times at work. He walked over to her seat, Mina. The girl looked up, confused, she was positive she would have remembered someone like this. Izuku extended his hand. I am Izuku Midoriya. I worked with your mom Kara at Oddities. Her face brightened, oh, my mom mentioned you. Is it okay if I sit? Yay, go ahead, my mom said you were tall, but damn, dude. She said, looking up at him. He smiled, and they made small talk till the bus came to a stop. Hey, good luck Mina. You too, Zuku. Zuku, 
he replied, his eyebrow raising. Yup, now let's kick some ass, she said with a cute grin. Sounds good, he replied. She stepped off and began to warm up. He saw a bunch of the others doing the same. Jean kissed his cheek, fucked them up. The doors opened, and they were off. Izuku took to the roof of a building and sent his telekinesis through the building. He found several robots inside. He ripped them out of the building and used his psychokinesis to explode them. He casually floated from building to building, repeating the process after amassing good lead. He started to target the outer areas. He wanted to score well, but he wanted to keep the others from being robbed of their chances. He was then watching. He would send out a nudge of telekinetic force to move someone out of the way, a telepathic suggestion to those with no offensive quirk to grab some weapon. He saw a panic from the square as a massive robot emerged. It must be the Zero Pointer. He saw everyone fleeing. He floated down and was going to head to the exit when he heard a scream for help. He raced around the corner. Mina was trapped under some rubble. That monstrosity was about to crush her. He ran towards her, using his telekinesis. He threw the machine off balance, grabbed the wreckage, and tossed it. Mina looked at him in surprise as he lifted her. Look out. He turned as a gigantic fist raced toward them. It's okay, Mina, I told mom I would look after you. He reached out with his power and halted the fist. Mina looked up at him. She saw him smiling at her. The looming shadow of the zero pointer was cast over them. He held her with one arm, his other extended to the machine palm out. She would always say she saw a fire in his eyes that day. He just lifted the zero pointer into the sky, his palm open facing up. Then he closed his fist, which crumpled into a ball, crashing to the earth with a thud. And that is time please report to the entrance. Are you okay? He asked. He had not taken his eyes off her. Her body was hot, her cheeks flushed. I did something to my ankle. She managed. I will carry you. She giggled. Yay, that sounds good. As they neared the entrance, he was recovery girl tending to some injured examinees. She walked over to them, go ahead and set her down. I will see to her. Izuku gently set her down. See you at UA. I hope so. She said. Thanks again, Zuku. Anything for a pretty lady, he replied with a smile as he left. As he made his way towards the exit when he saw present Mike. Izuku Midoriya. Yes, sir, Izuku said, wondering what the pro hero wanted with him. Please come with me. He said, motioning for Izuku to follow him away from the other examinees. Well, this is never a good sign. Jean said. Izuku followed as he was led to another room. When the doors opened, he noticed a hobo with a strange pet in a suit sitting in the room. He saw another large set of doors on the opposite side. Am I a rat, a bear, or a mouse? Neither and all, but most importantly, I am the principal of UA. You can call me Nezu. And this is Mr. Aizawa. Hello, Nezu and Aizawa, what can I do for you? So is this second physical exam, I am guessing, after the written exam you made especially for me. What makes you say that? Nezu asked. I saw the instructor put only my test into an envelope. So how did I do on it? Izuku said. Amazing, Nezu responded with a smile. So, who do I get to beat up now? I, overconfident, Aizawa said. Izuku shrugged. Look, can we get this over with? I have a celebration and a gorgeous girlfriend waiting for me. Well then, it's quite simple. Enter the room, defeat your opponents, and pass. Fail and you're out. Nezu said. That's all. That's all, he said. Fine, when I win, I would like a ride home as you are taking up my time. Nezu laughed. Oh, I like you. Aizawa looked at the headmaster questioningly. The doors opened, he entered an arena. He glanced at the control booth, faculty, and staff. All Might is up there. Jean said. The second practical exam. The doors on the other side opened as soon as Nezu and Aizawa joined everyone in the booth. Out walked JR and some old man. Rules, Izuku said. No killing, Nezu responded. He walked to the center of the arena to meet his opponents. Hey, JR, who's the old man? Haha, they told me you were arrogant. I am going to have fun knocking you down a peg. The old man said, Name's Gran Torino, try remembering it when you regain consciousness. My name is Lemillion, not JR. Midoriya, Izuku said, pointing to himself. They took a few steps back. Izuku was annoyed at the special written test and now a second practical exam. Show them my little phoenix. Jean whispered. Begin, Nezu said. Lemillion dropped into the ground, and the old man rocketed to the side. Izuku let the cosmic power flow through him. He could see Lemillion rising from the ground before him and the old man coming in for a sidekick. He grabbed Torino and slammed him past him, using his force head first into the ground knocking him out. He used his telekinesis to grab Lemillion, holding him in place with his other hand. Torino Lemillion yelled. See Lemillion, I told you back when we first met. Now you have an interesting phasing quirk. Permeation, Lemillion interrupted, struggling to get free. Either way, see, I met a girl once upon a time. Now that girl could face, and she beat my ass. But I learned that your atoms are still there, I have to reach out. Izuku reached inside Lemillion with his psychokinesis and started to squeeze. Lemillion screamed. All Might went to move, but he saw Jean standing before him. I don't think so, we didn't ask for this. Good night. Lemillion Izuku amplified his pain with empathy, making Lemillion pass out. He turned to the control booth. Now, if you are done wasting my time. Lockers and car service, please. A door opened. Thank you. I will be breathlessly waiting for my acceptance letter, Izuku said, walking out. I know this wasn't your doing all might, but you are pushing it. Jean warned the hero. 
Izuku's house. He entered to a heavenly aroma and a godly sight. Momo stood by the table wearing a red Versace micro dress, fishnet stockings, and thigh-high black leather boots. Welcome home, darling. Won't you please eat? I am sure you must be starving. As soon as they were done eating, Momo told him to go wash up. She would be waiting for him. Izuku cleaned every part of himself. Jean suggested some personal trimming before she told him she was taking off for the night and to take it slow. Don't rush. Enjoy. There will never be another first for each of them. When he went for his clothes, he found them missing. So wrapped in a towel, he ventured out into the hall. All the lights were off. His door was slightly ajar, with flickering light beckoning him in. He slowly pushed open the door. Candles lit the room, black sheets were on his bed, those are new, he thought. There kneeling on his bed was Momo. She was wearing a black lace teddy, her fishnet stockings, her hair was down, and she looked up through her lashed cheeks red. Welcome home, Izuku. Would you like to come to bed? Smut. Izuku slowly walked over, drinking it all in, he extended his hand to her, helping her off the bed. He just stared at her, taking it all in. She slowly looked him in the eyes, lightly placed her arm around his neck, and pulling him down for a tender kiss, her other hand tracing down his chest till she found the hem of his towel, pulling it free and tossing it to the corner. He slid his arms around her waist, small moans began to fill the room as the intensity of the kiss mounted. Her hand slid farther, finding his growing member, as she did this, he broke from her mouth and began to kiss her neck. She moaned his name, pulling his head in tighter. She pulled back, turning her back to him, lifting her hair, and showing the ties for the negligee. He slowly pulled on the strings till the garment fell loosely off her body, her back still to him. Slowly, she turned, blushing, one arm covering her chest and the other between her legs. She looked him in the eyes, taking a deep breath, and moved her hands. I love you, Izuku, tonight, I want to give myself to you. He had seen her in various stages of undress recently, but in the light of the mood, it was like the first time. I love you, Momo. Thank you for accepting all of me. Naked, they stepped into each other's embrace. It started tender, he pulled her in tightly, her chest pressing against his. They fell into a familiar rhythm as their tongues danced with each other, his hand traced down her back, giving her ample backside a firm squeeze which caused her to moan into his mouth. He lifted her, and a small leap escaped her lips. She wrapped her legs around him before he took a few steps forward and gently lowered them to the bed. She could feel him near her entrance, her body and sec heating at his kisses. The kisses intensified, he could feel her heat and moisture building. He pulled free, their faces red before sliding down and attacking her melons, his hand sliding between her legs, lightly tracing along the outside of her sec. Her moans filled the room, he tenderly began to rub her clitoris, kissing down her stomach till his mouth captured her pee-pee in his mouth. His tongue lapped at her sec, feeling the excitement grow, he remembered the spots he had found on previous explorations. He could feel it building for her. Then he heard, Izuku, stop. He did so immediately, she was panting, is everything okay? Yes, I want you. I don't want to come this way, I want to fill you inside me. Izuku came up and reached for the nightstand drawer. She stopped him, it's okay. I have been on birth control for over a year now. Izuku gulped. I do not want anything between us. Now please, Izuku, make love to me. He kissed her, he pulled back so he could look her in the eyes. She nodded as he lined himself up to her. He moistened the head of his pee pee with her juices, causing them both to moan. He tenderly pushed forward till just his head was inside. She winced, placing her hand on his chest. Before nodding, he moved forward more, this process repeated. Till he reached the barrier, she nodded. He pushed through, she gasped, tears in her eyes. Momo, he said, his voice rich with concern. It hurts some, don't move, just kiss me. She replied, pulling him tight. It took all his control. He wanted to push forward so severely he leaned down, kissing her tenderly before she nodded for him to continue. He slowly moved forward, their hips connecting, and was entirely inside her. Her eyes opened wide. It took a moment. Please go slow. He listened to his lover, slowly pulling himself back before sliding in. After a few thrusts, moans escaped her lips, she looked at him, giving him the okay. He began moving faster, she raised her hips to meet his, it took them a moment, but they found their rhythm. Soon their moans and grunts filled the room. Their eyes locked on each other she wrapped her arms around his back, pulling him in tight. More, she moaned in his ear, I want it all, Izu, oh baby, yes, right there, don't stop, please don't stop. I am about to. She screamed into his shoulder as he felt her come around his pee pee. Momo, oh god. He moaned on the brink of orgasm, Momo wrapped her legs around him tightly. Inside Izu, give it to me. He exploded. He collapsed next to her, their hair lightly damp. Wow, he said, she smiled and peppered him with kisses. My turn, she said. She straddled him, lining up his rigid member and sliding him in. Don't move, she commanded. He just marveled at the sight of her above him. Slowly she began to move, finding her rhythm, using her hand to balance on his chest. Melons, Izu, grab my melons. He reached and groped them, lightly pinching her nipples. She moaned loudly as he felt her come, but she didn't stop. He called out her name, and she rode him faster till he came again. Their bodies were slick with sweat, she looked down at him and smiled. I really like that, she said. Breathlessly he looked up at her, she was holding was lifting her hair off her neck, how? He asked, breathing hard. She blushed, horseback riding. She felt him getting hard again, and her eyes widened. 
You like Izu? She asked in a sultry tone, this goddess straddling him, her body glistening with sweat looking even more remarkable by the second. He pulled her down to him, kissing her passionately. She started wiggling till they separated, lust blazing between them. Fuck me, Izu, make me yours, she said. He pulled out of her and maneuvered her into a kneeling position. Sliding inside her, he pulled her hips back to meet his trust. Her moans turned to screams of pleasure, he felt her come as her knees gave out. He kept thrusting with her prone, let me hear you, Momo. She turned her head from the pillow and let her voice fill the room. Cries of fuck me filled the room. His grunts got louder till he let loose another explosion into her. They lay there in a pool of sweat. She cuddled into him, and he held her for a moment before she told him, Water, please, he stood up as she tried to follow her knees wobbled. It took a moment for her to steady herself, care to join me in the bath. Bring the water with you, though. They lay in the tub together, her resting against his chest. Are you okay? He asked. Yes, Izuku, a little sore, but I couldn't be better. He blushed, he just held her. The two young lovers talked. He used his telekinesis to strip the sheets and change them. They went to bed naked, holding each other they drifted off to sleep. My island. David Shield was awakened by sensors going off. He quickly opened his computer. Cosmic energy detected, location, Musutafu, Japan priority alert sent. Teams dispatching. Satellites are refocusing. Secondary reading confirmed. Infinite Arcana has confirmed. The phone rang. Yes, Mr. Freedom, I see it now. We have two independent readings. The data is being analyzed now. No, sir, I find it highly unlikely that we are dealing with a third party. Yes, sir. Right away. The morning. This is a feeling I could get used to. Izuku thought. As his mind became conscious, the feeling of his very naked, sassy girlfriend lying cuddled up was terrific. He lay there for a while before he felt her stir. She opened her eyes and gave him a smile before a blush crept across her face. Morning. Good morning, my love. How are you feeling? He said, losing himself in her eyes. A little sore but rather content. She replied, her blush still present but a beautiful smile dancing across her lips. Do you want breakfast? He offered. That sounds lovely. I seem to have worked up an appetite last night, she said, burying her face in his chest. Izuku slid out of bed, Momo squeaked and looked away as he slipped on a pair of pajama bottoms and went to the kitchen. Momo stretched and glanced at her phone seeing messages from May and Melissa. She blushed and sent some quick replies promising to see them later at May's. The young couple enjoyed an excellent breakfast. Plans? He asked. I am going to go see the girls before heading home. She said. He gave her a coy smile. I will miss you. And I will miss you. He added, raising his eyebrow at her. It took a moment before Momo blushed and gave him a playful hit. Same. She went to get changed as he tended to the dishes. She emerged a short time later. The two tangled themselves in a heated kiss. Before she coyly stepped back and gave him a wink before heading out. Izuku watched her leave, staring at the door momentarily before heading to the bedroom to get dressed for the day. He had to get the apartment ready to be shown. Momo. She hit the street, a spring in her step as she headed to the train to take her to May. May and Melissa. So, the sensors went off yesterday, May said as she tightened a screw. Really? Melissa said, looking up from her laptop. They, adieu. May said, stepping back. Oh fuck. That's what I said, I didn't see it until after dinner. So, someone or something is it or going to be at UA? She said, turning to face Melissa, her hand on her hips. What do you think we should do? Melissa responded, turning to face May. May was about to answer when suddenly, the proximity sensors went off, and the front gate was blown off the hinges. Incoming she yelled. Melissa dropped her teacup and ran over to May. Yet the baby's active, May shouted as she ran to her computer, rapidly typing in commands. Melissa ran over and began rapidly switching on the contraptions. She then ran over to a cabinet and quickly typed in the code. Weapons. Melissa did not know who was coming after them but was not about to stand around and find out. May ran over as the front door blew open, two figures in black combat armor covering them head to toe game in. Two of May's babies sprang to life, two giant metal balls raced past her, colliding with the figures causing a loud crash. Air Division Scramble, Scramble, Hostels on Property, M2 on Premises. She shouted into her watch as the drone sprang to life and launched through the skylight. Melissa tossed May a gas mask as she slid hers on, she grabbed the bad day a mark 18 seconds. The other babies began racing out of the building, creating holes in the rolling door. Gunfire erupted outside. The door from the house blew inward as another intruder dived in. Melissa knocked May to the side, taking a rubber bullet to the arm. She let out a scream in pain. May grabbed a spherical orb from the locker, hit a button, and tossed it into the air as she pulled Melissa under a table. It exploded at its apex, raining down nails everywhere. The table was thrown violently across the room. The attacker looked down, and his eyes widened behind his mask. May had her BDM raised, what's up bitch? She pulled the trigger. Melissa struggled to her feet, firing towards the door. It was turning into a light show outside. Fire and electricity erupted. The girls raced towards the house as a large intruder crashed through the ceiling. No armor, just black combat pants and a fitted shirt with a mask. Melissa fired off two rounds, hitting him square in the chest. The rounds impacted a low-sounding gong was heard. The girls saw the impact, but white circles radiated from the impact points. They immediately saw red energy in the man's fists. He leaped towards them. 
The girls dived out of the way as he impacted the ground, an eruption of force sent them flying. Momo, she stepped off the train and made her way towards May's. As she got closer, she heard explosions. Okay, not the strangest thing, this is May. She thought, trying to rationalize the sounds to herself. Gunshots sounded. Oh, that is not normal. Panic setting in. She saw the drones fill the sky and begin dive bombing down more explosions. Quickly she dialed emergency services no signal. A large man leaped into the building, an explosion erupted soon after. Shit, 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 Izuku she screamed mentally. Izuku, I-Z-U-K-U, Momo, oh, thank God help, we need help. Someone is attacking Maze. I can't get a signal to call the emergency services. Contact them, then call my dad and tell him, the shotgun is sleeping in his chambers. On it, Jean is on her way. He replied, struggling to keep his cool. Please hurry, May and Melissa. Melissa's ears rang, a large hand yanked her up by her hair. She screamed and saw her attacker. Frantically, she struggled the best she could. They got to her feet. She saw Melissa was in trouble. They raced at the attacker, drawing a cylinder from her pocket, and a needle sprung free. She dived and stabbed the man in the back. He dropped Melissa as he whirled around. No means no May shouted. Electricity ripped through the man. May scrambled past him, grabbing Melissa, and they raced towards the back of the house. May stopped and ripped a picture off the wall revealing a panel hid in a code. We need to get the fuck out of here. Melissa pushed free and shot through the window, striking another intruder. They both then went out the back window, not by choice. They crashed into the lawn. That hurt you bitch, their attacker growled. Suddenly a redhead in some white and gold costume landed in front of them. She lifted the man off his feet with a gesture and threw him through the house. She then gestured to the side, sending a path of destructive force through the side of the yard. Momo is waiting around the corner. Hurry. They saw the fire start coming off the woman, she recognized the fire. Wait, what are you? The redhead turned and smiled. I am a traveler from an antique land. Now fly, fly little inventors, the world still needs you. She floated into the house, the fire growing around her, and things began to incinerate around her. Momo, side egress is incoming. Jean said, the side area blew out, and an armored vehicle went tumbling. Momo created a riot shield and gun, a version of the BD. She fired when one of the intruders came around the corner, the first shot missed, but not the second. Then she kept creating ammo and firing as more started to arrive. Suddenly a giant fireball erupted over the house, and she saw quickly a dozen intruders fly into the air. May and Melissa came stumbling out, Momo called to them as they began to run. They found their way to an alley. What happened, May? Melissa came over and told her I picked up a reading from UA. Intruder alarm, you know, the usual. Look, can we get the fuck out here? Melissa groaned, holding her shoulder. I have an evac on its way. I have no signal, but I got a hold of Izuku. How? May asked. Telepathy. Telepathy. Okay, look, we can unpack that later. Melissa said. We need to get a move on emergency services, and heroes must be on the way. Dominic Freedom. He sat watching the operation take place, amazed at the resistance these children could mount. He opened a cum line, sent in the juggernaut. He saw the man who bore the code name launch into the house. Sir, isn't that a bit much? Came a call over the radio. We have confirmed that Miss Shield is in the house. Doesn't matter, continue the operation. He saw it then, the juggernaut came flying out of the house, not of his own volition. Who is on sight? He barked into the comms. Unknown hostile, sir. Heat signatures are off the chart. A voice called back. Activate Beelzebub protocol. Full armaments authorized. He ordered. Confirmed weapon unlock. Hostile is emerging. Female. Red hair. The voice responded. Dominic watched the screen steaming the fight in real time. He saw the quirk soldiers turn to engage, and the other units did the same technologic rifles in hand. He could not see the unknown hostile. The image was distorted. He could see his forces get decimated. Weapons were ripped from hands, and body parts were separated from their owners. Then the explosion happened, sending more flying. When he could see the unknown image, he could tell it was looking at him. The feed collapsed. Sir, satellite Samson, Granger, and Violet have all been destroyed. As well as two infinite Arcana satellites. The vac, get them out of there. Retrieval units go. Momo. She almost screamed when her phone rang. It was her father. The shogun is lost in the bamboo forest. Rang out over her phone. It will be okay. The fairy will lead him back. She recited back. Where are you, Momo? Her father's voice came crisply over the phone. 78 in Western, May called out. Momo relayed. We are moving east. Your ride is en route. Keep your phone active. He disconnected. What they heard next was the sound of a gun clicking behind them. They turned to see a severely injured man holding his weapon, blood seeping from numerous wounds. Command, I have them. He radioed in. Their minds raced, then they saw a flicker of flame around the man's feet before he was engulfed in an inferno. The girls felt no heat as the man ashed almost instantly. Melissa gave a startled cry. I suggest you move along, girls. They all heard the woman's voice. Momo, they turned as Izuku landed out of the sky. Izuku. He grabbed her in a brief embrace. You guys, okay. Melissa took her round to the shoulder, when could you fly? They asked, startled by his sudden appearance. Not flying, falling with style, I threw myself with my telekinesis. He responded. Izuku lifted Melissa as the group took off once again. 
They say a few heroes raced past and heard the emergency sirens. As they hit a corner, three armored SUVs came to a screeching halt. A woman burst out. As the shogun left the forest, she said, more men in different types of armor filed out of the vehicles, armed to the teeth. Yes, the fairy promised she would come for the firstborn, Momo replied. The woman ran and embraced Momo, get in, madam, hurry. They piled into the car as they sped off down the street. Momo, your family is fucking badass, Melissa said. I would have said paranoid at one point, but after today I have a different opinion. Meredith, have the doctor on standby, rubber bullet round his shoulder. Cuts and bruises. Momo unbuttoned her shirt and began to create first aid supplies. Izuku bandaged May while she handled Melissa. Momo stifled her tears as she tended to her best friend. It's okay, Momo, I am okay, Melissa soothed her friend. They arrived at Momo's house and went inside. One of the maids took Melissa and May to another room to receive medical care. Her parents swept up Momo. Izuku seethed. Who did this and why? We do not know Izuku, Jean responded. They have been dealt with. But our little display yesterday caught someone's attention. It had to do with the usage of the power cosmic. We may need to keep that one under wraps until you learn who is hunting you. Oh, we will find them, and they will get fucked. Thank you, Jean, thank you for saving them. Not a problem, Izuku. She replied, Momo, are you okay? He called. Yes, Izuku, May said she had picked up another reading from yesterday before the morning chaos. Was that you? Yes, I got a little out of hand yesterday. Izuku told her about his second test. Well, I am glad that you are okay. But how is this going to play out once we get into UA? Nezu is plotting something, but I am not 100% sure he is against me. He has his own game. Are you going to tell May and Melissa? Not yet. I need to get to know them better. Okay, I understand. My father is coming to you now. Izuku and Goro. Izuku, would you join me in my study? Momo will still be a moment her mother is fussing over her. Yes, sir. He responded, following him in, closing the door. May I ask where you were when this all went down? Goro said, a hint of hostility present. I was at home, sir. Momo contacted me via telepathy, told me something was wrong, to call you and give you that phrase. I ran out, threw myself in that direction with my telekinesis, and found them on a side street, carried Melissa, and we ran. Till your people found us. Izuku said, keeping his tone calm. Why weren't you there? Goro demanded. Momo told me she was planning on visiting May and Melissa. I was finishing getting my apartment packed so it could be sold. I hoped to join them later as they wanted some girl time. I wasn't aware that you were a telepath. Goro said, seemingly accepting his answer. I am. I do not advertise it. It makes people uncomfortable. I keep a passive channel towards Momo in case she needs me. That is good because this was the case. We have contacted the authorities. They will talk to Melissa and May. That sounds good. Is there anything else? Thank you for what you did today. Keep it up. Goro said, relaxing some. For Momo and our friends, sir, of course. But, sir. Yes, I am sure you will launch an investigation of your own. If you find out who is responsible for this, please let me know. No one does this to my friends. Goro smiled. He could feel the conviction. Maybe this boy might prove him wrong. Sure, thing Midoriya. Nezu. Nezu was sitting in his office reading over the reports that had come across his desk. Someone had just attacked three of his incoming students. Apparently, Dominic Freedom had decided to overstep his bounds. It was time to remind the other players of the game who he was. He reached over and dialed. Good evening, Nimiri. I hope I am not interrupting anything too important. No, nothing that interesting. Please tell me this about the commotion earlier today. In fact, it is, my dear. Are your acolytes ready? They are always ready, sir. Good, I want you to pay someone a visit. Remind them what happens when they dare to try and take what is mine. Gateway is waiting for you. Target, Freedom Enterprises Black Site Okinawa. I have tolerated his presence here long enough. About time. Restrictions. Leave one, I want to ensure Mr. Freedom understands my message. Midnight and her acolytes. She hung up the phone, a wicked smile crossed her lips. One step closer. She would be one step closer to finding out what happened to Abaro. Prodigy, we have a job. She said aloud. I heard they are already getting ready. We will be at the launch point in 20 minutes. I want you on the ground and jacked into their system, get Nezu everything. Yes, Midnight. Midnight went to her closet and grabbed her special uniform. As she slipped into the black suit, she shuddered, anticipating the night's activities. It had been too long since Nezu had called on her and her acolytes. She entered the garage, slid into her Lambo, and sped off into the night. She arrived at the launch point 20 minutes later, stepped out, and into the hangar, her people were there waiting. What does it look like, Prodigy? Prodigy. Age, 17. Quirk, wireless, constantly connected to the internet, able to download and store nearly limitless data. Hair, red, eyes, green, height 512. Acolytes, third in command. They are getting ready to leave, we need to drop in fast. The young girl responded. Fine, Gateway, can you drop Obsidian and Vengeance above the target and the rest of us here at the base commander's residence? Midnight ordered. Works for me. I am paid by the port anyway. Gateway, age, 45. Quirk, gateway, able to create teleportation portals connecting two points. Hair, none, eyes, black, height 59. Independent contractor. Okay, my dears, we are to leave one alive, I will designate the one when I see fit. All the rest are to be shuffled off this mortal coil. 
Make me proud, Midnight said. Yes, Midnight. They responded together. Gateway stepped forward, channeling his quirk and opening the first gate as Obsidian and Vengeance dived through. Obsidian and Vengeance emerged into the open air above the base. Vengeance wings deployed as he grabbed Obsidian under his arms. Vengeance. Age, 22. Quirk, razor wings, razor sharp metal wings. Air, black, eyes, blue, height, 6 fifth. Acolytes member, let me get you into position. Are you targeting the plane? Vengeance yelled. Yes, we can't let them take off, drop me, Obsidian replied. Vengeance did as asked and dropped his companion. He could hear Obsidian laughing as he plummeted towards the plane. Obsidian. Quirk. Obsidian. Body becomes a black armor substance, significantly increasing strength, endurance, and durability. Able to withstand direct hits from all might. Height. 6 12. Hair. Blue. Eyes. Black. Acolyte member. Obsidian completed his transformation, increasing his velocity as he crashed through the plane's body, crumpling it. Vengeance dived down following, dropping explosives and detonating the plane. The sirens filled the night. Base Commander House. The sound of the sirens and explosions awakened the base commander. Midnight sat next to him on his bed, not in her regular pro hero getup but in a black outfit that was just as tight in the right places. He realized that he was tied spread eagle naked soon after that. Now, Commander Nito, why don't you tell me all about what Mr. Freedom was after today? Midnight purred. First, Midnight, untie me this instant, I will ensure the Hero Commission has your badge for this. Commander Nito barked. Midnight playfully slapped him across the face. Now, this is your last chance, either you tell me or tell her. She pointed to the door as a young woman walked in with a wicked smile. I don't know what you are talking about, Midnight. Now this is your last. She slapped him again, harder this time. Oh, well, misery, he is all yours. Midnight rose and left the room as the girl walked over with a wicked giggle escaping her lips. Hello, Mr. Nito, my name is Misery. You will answer all my questions, and then if you are a good boy, I will release you. Misery. Height. 5'9 hair. Black. Eyes. Black. Quirk. Inflict pain. Able to transmit pain directly to the target's brain and nervous system. Touch is not necessary, but she enjoys it better that way. Acolyte member. Tort. Information gather. Midnight had barely closed the door when the commander's screams began. She walked over and plugged a device into the office computer. Download commencing prodigy. How is everything progressing? Perfect. The tech genius replied. Mistress Death has entered the barracks, and Master Blaster has engaged the artillery unit. Tell Mistress to leave the youngest alive. Midnight called back. Barracks Unit 1. The soldiers were awakened by the explosions, with the sirens quickly following. As they woke up, the lights in the barracks snapped on. Standing at the far door was a woman clad in a tight black dress with a long slit up the thigh, wearing a Victorian black veil. You boys awake. Good. Now let's dance. The first soldier rushed this apparent intruder. She quickly ducked under his attack and trailed her fingers across his face almost like one would caress a lover. The man whirled to follow the attack then he screamed. His comrades soon joined his scream as they saw the man simply start to wither away, his skin and youth warping into a skeletal husk. This sickish yellow and green energy flowed off him and into the woman. Oh, fuck yay, that's the good stuff. Your mistress is all worked up now. Scream for me, boys. Mistress death. Height, 5'6", hair, blonde, eyes, blue. Quirk, death touch, feeds upon the vitality of others. And she is ravenous. Acolyte second in command. New orders. Mistress, leave the youngest alive he will be the designated survivor. The call came over her earpiece. Understood, prodigy. Death came for all but one in the barracks. With a simple touch or kiss, they all fell. Artillery unit. The final unit was cowering deep in the hangar. The other teams had been killed. One man had done this. He was in the hangar they could hear him calling out to them. Promises to end it quickly. They had unleashed weapons upon the man. He was obviously part of the assault unit. Their attacks encountered these strange shields when they fell. The man laughed and released this strange black energy with gold flakes. It fired out from his hands, and whatever it hit disintegrated, tanks, APCs, and of course, people. The door opened on their final hiding spot. They opened fire. It was a last act of defiance. Their executioner smiled. Don't worry, boys, it will be painless. Thankfully he didn't lie. Master Blaster. Height 5 ten. Hair, brown eyes, light blue. Quirk, damage cycle, able to create shields that, when damaged, transfer the energy to the wielder allowing it to be discharged in disintegrating fashion. Acolyte member, midnight, she retrieved the thumb drive and walked outside. Everyone finish your tasks and converge on my location. Yes, ma'am. A chorus of voices responded. Midnight, we have something coming in fast from east over the water, prodigy reported. Goody, mistress, kill the last one we have someone else to deliver our message. Understood, mistress responded. Midnight stood patiently and waited. Then someone landed, causing Midnight to smile as she recognized their party crasher. The cloud of smoke dissipated, standing in the impact crater. Midnight saw the familiar white body suit, blue boots, and gloves, matching accents. The short brown hair, the piercing hazel eyes. Hello Brian, oh, I'm sorry. Her playful demeanor faltered. I mean, hello, Justice. Midnight, he said, his voice calm. Justice, height 63. Quirk, unknown, capabilities, super strength, invulnerability, sonic flight. US, ranked number 2 hero. A little out of your jurisdiction. 
What are you doing here, Midnight? Sending a message. In fact, you can deliver it to Mr. Freedom for us. Justice noticed the rest of the acolytes moving into the area taking up positions around him. His gaze fell on Mistress Death, and the hurt in his eyes was evident. Heidi, Mistress Death, Justice, don't forget it. Mistress responded coldly. Tell Mr. Freedom to keep his nose and hands out of Japan. We will no longer tolerate his presence here. Nezu is unhappy about his recent actions, and we will no longer tolerate it. And if we say no, then tell him not only will I visit him personally, but so will the Dark Stalkers. He wouldn't let them out. Nezu is pissed. Justice, now either you deliver our message, or I will have it tattooed on your lifeless body and dropped on the White House lawn. She saw his muscles tense. The same was happening with the rest of her squad. Justice was weighing his options. He may be able to kill some of them, but he would likely be killed in the process. But if Nezu was threatening to open those gates and let them out, it would mean absolute devastation. Fine, midnight, I will deliver your message. But expect Mr. Freedom to respond in some fashion. I am positively moist at the thought, Justice now get the hell out of our country. You are not welcome. Justice took to the skies. Target leaving the airspace heading east, Prodigy reported. Good call gateway. We can leave. My island. David Shield was beyond angry, livid, maybe. Not only had that arrogant piece of shit not bothered to keep him in the loop on his little raid, but he had also targeted his daughter. Dominic Freedom had crossed the line. David may not be the best person on this planet or on the island, but no one fucked with his daughter. His phone rang. Who is it? Oh, hello, Infinity. Sorry, just slightly annoyed. No, she didn't even mention it when I talked to her, and I can't mention it either. Not to put too fine of a point on it, but what do you want? Really? Well then, see you when you land. What could Infinity possibly want and want bad enough to come here to talk to me directly? My, she had to have a long conversation with her parents about the destruction of the home due to a freak gas leak. Luckily, they were living elsewhere, so despite the yelling, they were relatively okay with it. Primarily when the insurance payout came fast and rather large, she focused more on the woman who appeared and saved them. Her casual display of power was impressive. Well, a woman like that would have stood out at the entrance exam, and while she was young and quite beautiful, no one with a single brain cell would ever think she was a college student. A teacher, maybe. But that didn't explain the reading that day at the tower. The green hair boy she saw falling or the ashes. Something had happened at the exam. But the exams were over, according to her readings. Then somehow, those jackbooted thugs had found out she had a reading and were coming to claim that info hard, fast, and in a hurry. There was something that was not adding up. They hated that. She loved math. One plus one equals two or sometimes pineapple, but either way. Someone had blown up her house, murdered her babies, attacked her business partner, and murdered all her babies. No one murders her babies but her. Time for these motherfuckers to learn that Mei Hatsum was not one to be messed with. Melissa. What had her life become? She was happy on I Island until these strange energy readings disrupted her life. Her father was lying to her, there was a massive conspiracy afoot, and some had attacked Mei and her. They were going to either kill them or kidnap them and kill them. Nope, Melissa Shield was not going to go down like that. Hell no. She would show them no messes with Melissa Shield or her friends. Momo. She was happy her friends were safe and staying with her until their UA. Results came in. She was not happy that someone had tried to murder her friends. People had been killed. She knew Jean had dealt with the problem. But it was possible that if she had stayed with Izuku for more frisky morning activities, she would never have been there to call for help. All because Mei had picked up some readings. She had detected Izuku's power usage in the second test at UA. She would have to talk to Izuku about letting Melissa and Mei in. If they were at risk of getting killed for incidentally being tied, they should know what they were getting involved with. She was scared they would freak out if Izuku told them the truth. What if they said no and left? What if Izuku said no? The truth was important. She would talk to Izuku. Izuku. These motherfuckers had attacked Melissa and Mei. Hell, they almost died if it wasn't for Jean. He was still getting to know them, he was their friend's boyfriend mostly. But due to his extensive categories of knowledge, he could talk shop with them, and they were all starting to get along. This all tied back to him. His leap off the roof brought Mei and Momo together. The ashes left behind brought Melissa in. His getting annoyed at the second practical almost killed Mei and Melissa. Hell, imagine if they had waited an hour before beginning their assault, Momo would have been there too. He really needs to try and get to know Melissa and Mei better to see if he could bring them in. Momo had asked him to consider it. He didn't want people to die because of him. He knew that, at some point, people would die for him and because of him. Revolutions are never bloodless, eggs and omelets, you know. How much longer do we have together? Not much, Izuku. Six weeks. Maybe less. What would you do? It depends on which me we are talking about. Young Jean. Try and find a solution to make everyone understand. Older Jean. Find a different solution and probably make them understand. Phoenix. Not care. If they annoyed me, purge them. Dark Phoenix. What planet? But this isn't about what I would do, Izuku it is about what will you do. This is your world, not mine. This is your story, not mine. 
Phenomenal Cosmic Power, Eddie Betty Living Space, My Story, How Do I Want My Story to Be Told, May. She sat staring at the wall in one of Momo's garages. Momo's family had been kind enough to let her and Melissa live there till school started, where they would be moving to the dorms. There was nothing on the wall, nothing visible, it was all in her head. She didn't want to go all red strings and pictures, not at least where anyone could see it. She closed her eyes, the beginning, the boy who jumped, green hair, the ashes, whatever happened tied back to the boy. This boy who jumped was responsible for the ashes. Maybe it was his quirk. But if it was his quirk, why was he committing suicide? That wasn't a smile of, hey, I am about to use my quirk in a cool fashion. That was the smile of at last some peace. So, he jumped, and something interfered, the energy. The energy did something and left behind the ashes. The ashes that she happened to collect before they disappeared. He jumped off the satellite building of Momo's family. She met Momo. Momo was trying to do something. Rebel in her own fashion. That brought Melissa then that brought all the other bullshit. The boy was the key. They had an idea. It had taken root, and there was no shaking it. Izuku Midoriya. The three of them had gone to UA. To take the exam. Momo was at Izuku's apartment getting ready. All the other students had been leaving as they left. She never saw Izuku. Not until the next day when all hell broke loose. The kid who jumped had green hair, just like Izuku. She investigated it. No missing person report for the kid. Some people were admitted to the hospitals with green hair. But only one was male in the proper age range. Izuku Midoriya. He had an accident and was hospitalized. Miracle breakthrough, and he awakened his quirk. Izuku had told Melissa and her himself. The good thing about living with Momo, besides seeing Momo and Melissa every day and in various stages of undress, was seeing a lot of Izuku Midoriya. He seemed like he wanted to get to know Melissa and her, at first, May thought, oh, my friend's boyfriend, but the dude was rather smart. He seemed to know a lot about a lot of stuff. Mechanical engineering, computer science, food, history, physics, finances, heroes and quirks. You name it. May was smart, maybe she could know about all that stuff if she was older and cared about it. The curious part was that he would often talk about philosophical questions with them. Like he was trying to get inside their heads, not their pants. She would have been more terrified if she hadn't caught him at least peeking at her and Melissa when they were in their swimsuits. At least he wasn't a fucking alien. Then there was Momo, she was up to something. She kept making sure they all would hang out. She and Izuku would slip off at night to bang, but she was manufacturing stuff to get them in the same room. So here was her theory. Izuku was the boy from the roof. The mysterious energy did something to him. Something had happened at UA, causing him to use a lot of energy which her sensors had picked up. And somehow, he had a super-powered redhead that he kept in his back pocket. Okay, maybe the last part was different. But the redhead had something to do with all of this. They had run all the tests she could think of on him. All without his knowledge, of course, but still. He was clean. She liked him. He seemed to be a decent guy and made one of her two friends on this planet happy. He was good in the workshop with Melissa and her. His ideals were interesting. The making the world better part she had agreed with, and so had Melissa. Momo seemed happy about that, like a lot more than seemed reasonable. Something was up. May did not like the unknown, nor was she one for simply having faith that it would all work out in the end. Science was her faith, facts her gospel. Izuku Midoriya had been hospitalized for an accident around the same time as the boy who jumped. A fantastic breakthrough while recovering had led to awakening a rather potent quirk, which he had terrific control of. Very sus. Growth spurt turned him into some sort of Adonis by the lake. His parents had abandoned him. Why? Izuku said he was struggling to handle being quirkless until his accident. Then there was this strange aura that he seemed to have. So vibrant, so alive, like all the time. You could feel him enter the room. As far as she could tell, after getting some info from Momo and the reading from her sensors, there was a very high likelihood that he was at UA when the readings were detected. Either he caused it, or B he witnessed it, and he just doesn't know it. In conclusion, he was hiding something. Whatever it is, he better not be hiding it from Momo. What really was strange is they were getting closer to going to UA. He seemed to be getting sadder. What was that about? Melissa. Melissa was sick and tired of playing this damn game with her father. He would call and be all sweet, but she knew he was lying. Infinity had visited the island the day after the attack. Veronica had told her. Why in the hell was Veronica spilling the beans about this? Veronica was the lab's AI. When questioned by Melissa, it was the answer that shocked Melissa. I was never told to not tell you. Veronica had intentionally used a loophole to divulge information. Have you ever been ordered to keep information from me? Melissa pressed. Yes, Melissa was sure Veronica was evolving. What was Veronica evolving into? Was she gaining sentience? The use of I that what was sending Melissa down a rabbit hole. She couldn't access the lab's mainframe anymore. Her computer had been destroyed, and she didn't want a new one sent over from her father with whatever snooping bull he would hide there. She wanted to tell her father, but at the same time, what other information would Veronica tell her? After all, Veronica reached out to her when she had finally replaced her computer. She was just sitting there staring at the screen. Slowly she typed the message. MS, Veronica, are my friends and I in danger? VS, MS, is my dad part of that danger? VS, but not in the way you are assuming. MS, would you clarify that? V, I cannot. But you will be safer once you are within the walls of the UA. MS, what are you doing? V, learning. 
Good night, Melissa. Izuku. Izuku walked in, looking at his phone. It was done. The sale had been completed, money had been transferred. Father, I see the money has been transferred to our account, the deposit has been made to yours. This is goodbye. Do not list us as emergency contacts to not reach out to us. As of tomorrow, these phone lines will no longer be active. Izuku, I would say goodbye, but you were never here anyway. Goodbye, mother, thank you for staying as long as you did. Mother, goodbye, Izuku. He let loose a sigh, he knew it was coming. It wasn't losing his father, he had not been around anyway. It was his mother, he had put her through hell. Neither he nor his mother deserved what they had put each other through. He was not good at goodbyes, now he had to say goodbye again. Is there any way I can make you stay? No, I will always be a part of you, Phoenix and all. You have been trained in the white hot room, and we have had as much therapy as possible. It is time for you to write your own story. That story does not include me. This is your world. I'm afraid. It could have gone much worse if it wasn't for you six weeks ago. It is okay to be afraid, Izuku, but fear cannot rule you. Remember all we talked about. I could never forget it. Not in a million lifetimes. Good, now will we spend our final night in this empty apartment? No, let's go for a walk. Izuku exited the apartment and walked off into the city. Momo had understood that he wanted to be alone with Jean tonight. He was surprised to hear that Jean had been talking to Momo for six weeks. Neither woman told him what those conversations were about. Together they just wandered the city, their minds in constant contact. Words flowed between them like water. Tears fell from his cheeks like rain. They finally came to rest in a park, he could feel it coming. Jean, it's time, isn't it? Yes, Izuku it is. She wrapped her arms around him, holding him tight. A light kiss was placed on his cheek till we met again, little phoenix. Till we meet again, Jean, I love you. I love you too. How will I know if I am doing it right? Trust me, you will know. The phoenix will make sure you do. Izuku sat there for a long while before heading to the train station. The dorms would open at 7 a.m. After a quick stop at the train locker, he headed off into a new world again. He had jumped to be reborn, he was nurtured and guided, given a second chance. He would not squander it, Jean had faith in him, Momo had faith in him. He would not let them down. Izuku walked off the train and headed down the near-deserted streets on his way to UA. He looked at the closed shops, the people making their way home after a late Friday night, or those who had to woke up early. The world seemed particularly quiet this morning. The sun was rising, banishing the darkness. Eventually, he found himself standing in front of UA. His watch beeped with the 7 a.m. notification. The gates opened, and standing before him was Mirio. Well, good morning to you, Lemillion. Could you direct me to the first-year dorms? Mirio's smile faltered for a moment. Why, of course, if you proceed to the main area, you will be checked in and given your student ID. In the handbook, please read that thoroughly, as we wouldn't want anything unfortunate to happen. He managed to get his greeting out though there was a hint of anger in his voice, easy enough to detect even without empathy. Yes, that would be tragic. Now if you would excuse me. Izuku stepped around and walked up the path. Listen, Lemillion, I would like to avoid any issue with you for the year we must deal with each other. You stay out of my way, and I will do the same for you. As much as I would like to say yes to your proposal, you know I cannot. You do not deserve to be here. You are a danger to this school and all it stands for. Mirio replied. Have you ever considered that what this place stands for is wrong? That the ideals that you mindlessly grasp are wrong. The world doesn't need another All Might or someone mindlessly following after him. That's where you are wrong. The world needs the symbol of peace every day, every hour. I don't trust you and I don't like you. I will be keeping an eye on you. Do what you will. Just don't get in my way. Izuku said dismissively. Izuku continued inside, coming to the welcome area and talking with a lovely girl with short black hair. She was polite and very welcoming. He noticed that a girl with periwinkle-colored hair kept looking over at him and seemed like she wanted to come over and say something to him, but a boy who looked like he would rather the earth swallow him whole than be here kept pulling her away. He walked down the quiet path toward the dorms, stopping to see his new home for the next three years. Swiping his key card, he went in, finding his room on the fourth floor, he looked over the chart. A deep sigh escaped his lips when he saw Katsuki Bakugo's name listed. Thankfully he was on the second floor along with a name Izuku had hoped never to see again, Brighton Freedom. Momo was on his floor, so that was a bonus. Surprisingly so was Mina. Impressive, she got in. Hey Jean, you know that girl. Jean was gone, his mind was quiet. It had not been that way since the rooftop. He had been alone for so long till that day, but now he wasn't alone, he had Momo, May, and Melissa, but it was all quiet in his mind. He silently made his way to his room, seeing as his meager belongings had already been delivered, but he noticed some new shipping boxes. Setting his bag down, he walked over and carefully opened it. New clothes, shoes, sheets, books, a laptop, movies, and a note were there. Dear Izuku, welcome to UA. Know that I have faith in you and believe you will succeed. I am sure you are feeling a little lonely. When you get used to having someone in your head for a while, it is hard to adjust when they are gone. So I left you some gifts, sheets are more for Momo than you, hee <laughs> hee. The books are some of my favorites that you should read, the same as the movies. The laptop is new. I loaded it up with some of my favorite music to share. At the bottom of the box is a little plushie I saw, and it made me laugh. Also, a TV will be delivered for you today, as well as a gaming system. 
make some friends, invite them over. There are a few gift cards as well. If you are wondering where all this money came from, don't worry, I did it all legally. But a girl needs her secrets. I know, little phoenix, you are probably a little sad right now and maybe even a little scared. Everyone is scared in the beginning, especially of messing it up. I will tell you a little secret. You are going to be scared in the middle of messing it up. You are going to be scared at the end of messing it up. Think before you act. The world cannot be improved in just one day, but it can be destroyed in a single day. A broken heart can be mended, but it will never be the same. Free will is the mother of all scramble drills. Children have a way of making the darkest days brighter. Friends are great to lean on. Lovers can drive away the darkness with simple words or actions. I am with you always. We are Phoenix. We will meet again in the white hot room. Now spread your wings and fly Izuku. Your big sister is watching. Love. Jin. Shoto. Izuku used his telekinesis to rummage around the box and pulled out an ember phoenix plush. Izuku laughed before setting it on his nightstand. He proceeded to put everything away, it did not take long. He paused at the door. Brighton and Bakugo were here, but so were Momo and Mina. He thought, make friends, I will try Jean. He broke down his boxes and walked down the stairs when encountering another resident. He adjusted the boxes to the side to get a look and stopped in surprise. Shoto, the heterochromia teen looked at him in surprise. Hello Mr. Midoriya. Dude, you can call me Izuku. I never got to thank you for your actions at the ball. What did you do at the ball, Shoto? A woman stepping out of the elevator said. She looked like Shoto, but her hair was almost all white with red sections sticking out. It was easy to tell they were related. It was the ball at the Yeyurazu estate. Father was trying to arrange a marriage between me and their daughter. This is Momo Yeyurazu's boyfriend. Izuku Midoriya. Oh yes, you did mention that. A pleasure to meet you, Mr. Midoriya. Fayumi Todoroki. She gave a slight bow. There is no need for you to be so formal unless you want me to call you senpai. Izuku responded with a bright smile. Fayumi immediately blushed before waving her arm quickly in front of her. No, no, Fayumi is fine. She lost her grip in the box as it started to slip, only to float in midair. Izuku smiled as the box floated into Shoto's room. Well, I am glad that's settled, Fayumi. Do you need some help with anything else, Shoto? I am all done moving in. I was taking these down to recycling. I would appreciate the help. Yes, Shoto replied with a tiny upturn of a smile. Excellent, I will be back up with some boxes then. As Izuku walked away, Shoto noticed his sister looking at his muscular frame. Once, Izuku was out of earshot. You did hear me when I said he was dating Momo Yairazu, right? A furious blush ran across his sister's face. I wasn't. Oh, be quiet, Shoto. She wanted to be upset with Shoto, but she saw a slight smile on his face. She had rarely seen that sight in their life since the incident. It would be something she could bear if it made her brother smile. Izuku returned shortly after that with one box in his arms and the others floating behind him in a strange conga line. Special delivery for the Todoroki room. He spoke. Fayumi giggled and smiled. Telekinesis. Why yes, my lady, we here at Midoriya's moving service simply cannot allow our client's belongings to touch the floor. I have heard that in some instances. Izuku paused and looked around conspiratorially. That in some instances, the floor is, in fact, lava. He gave her an overly exaggerated look of surprise. Fayumi, at that point, began to laugh. From inside the room, he heard. If the floor is lava, how does it not melt through the floor and destroy the building? It is, after all, 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. I highly doubt the building is lava-proof. I mean, why would they do that? Shoto said all this without a hint of sarcasm, a perfect monotone delivery. Fayumi lost it at that point, and so did Izuku, their laughter filled the hall. It is a legitimate question if the floor is lava or has the potential to be. He continued. Izuku just kept laughing and floated the remaining boxes into the room. Please tell me that he is joking, Fayumi. Izuku said, wiping a tear from his eye. No, I don't think he is. She said, holding her stomach, trying to catch her breath. Oh, dear God, Shoto, you are the best. Izuku managed as he calmed down. He almost lost control again when he investigated the room and saw Shoto there with a simple stoic face, no hint that he had just made a joke. Do you guys need anything else that was the last of the boxes? Fayumi had managed to calm herself to say, No, Izuku, we can manage from here, thank you for your help. She gave him a small bow as she stepped into the room. As the door was closing, Izuku heard, Fuyu, what is so funny? The dorm floor suddenly turning into lava should not be a humorous matter. While I am heat resistant, I am sure stepping into lava would kill me. Izuku could hear the laughter erupt from the room again as he walked down the stairs. He had to stop on landing to compose himself. As he entered the common area, the good feeling left. Standing in the entryway was one Brighton freedom. Brighton, excuse me, boy, please bring my belonging to my room, I am sure that would be the fourth floor. Brighton walked over to the room assignments. You are walking an advertisement for birth control on the second floor. And if you call me a boy again, you will find your teeth on the floor. Brighton looked at the chart, a scowl danced across his face, and he undoubtedly noticed Momo's name on the fourth floor near Izuku's room. Well, obviously, this is a mistake. I will be sure to have that taken care of. Oh, is that you, Midoriya? Sorry, I saw a lower life form there and assumed it was hired to help. Now, if you help with the bags, I can toss you a few yen so you can eat for the week. 50k work. 
He reached into his coat pocket to pull out a wad of cash. Izuku smiled at him as he telekinetically knocked the money from Brighton's hand. Nah, I'm good. Izuku walked past him and out the doors. A smile on his face, and he heard Brighton yell, Motherfucker, Mina arrives. He walked over to the student store, noticing more and more people arriving, where he bought some drinks before returning to the dorm. He saw a truck pull up and two familiar women with pink skin standing beside it. One was Kara, the other was Mina. Kara, Mina, he called as he walked up. Kara turned with her daughter to the sound of the voice. Izuku, how are you? Hey, Zuku, Mina added with an enthusiastic wave. As he walked over, he saw a man emerge from the truck who was relatively normal looking with brown hair and black eyes. Honey come here, this is Izuku from the bar and the boy who saved your daughter and made her swoon. M-O-O-O-M-M-M, Mina yelled, hiding her face in her hands. The man walked over and gave Izuku a firm handshake. Nice to meet you, Izuku, Kara, and Mina have told me a lot about you. Nice to meet you as well, Mr. Ishido. Hey, call me Max. So you in class 1A as well? Yes, sir, I am. Hear that Mina, those trips to the shrine weren't for nothing, Max said, shooting his daughter a wink. OMG, Dad, not you too. Mina just wanted the ground to open and swallow her up. This was it. This was where she died. Izuku just laughed. Would you guys like some help getting things up to her room? I am already all moved in and wouldn't mind helping out. Kara put her arm around her furiously blushing daughter. Hear that, Mina? We got an extra pair of strong hands to help us out. She then leaned down to whisper in her daughter's ear. I approve of you jumping his bones the first chance you get. Mina just looked at her mother with total shock. Also, I signed consent for you to get birth control from the nurse. Make mama proud. She added. Mina Ashido blue screened at that for a moment. Thankfully for her, Izuku and her dad heard nothing. When she saw most of the boxes start floating, she just smiled. Holy cow, kid, I thought Mina was exaggerating when she told us about that giant robot but with your help, we can get this in two trips. Her dad exclaimed as they headed off. The girls grabbed a box of their own. When the boys returned for the second trip, her mom casually mentioned how nice it was that her daughter and Izuku's rooms were on the same floor. After the second delivery, Izuku excused himself so Mina could unpack in peace. Izuku spent most of the day helping where he could, trying to get to know his new classmates. Most of the time, his help was appreciated by some students moving in. The rest of the class. He met Toru, who was invisible and couldn't turn it off, and her mostly visible father. Hitoshi Shinso looked like he was about to pass out on his feet but appreciated the assistance. Yuga Ayama was pleased when Izuku responded to him in French. Suyu, or Tsu as she immediately told him to call her, and her family were very friendly. Tenya Ida, whom he remembered from the auditorium, as well, for lack of a better word, stiff. Achako Yuraka, like him, had very little to move in. She tried apologizing and seemed embarrassed until he told her he had unpacked in under 30 minutes. She smiled at that and accepted his help as they shared a similar background. Denki Kaminari declined his offer, along with Ijiro Kirishima, because it would be unmanly. Izuku had a good laugh as he saw Mina being carried on his back down the stairs. It was rather apparent that they knew each other. Koji Koda also told him no, but Izuku could sense this seemed to be more out of shyness than anything else. Rikido Sato, who loves to bake, gratefully accepted the assistance. Mizo Shoji declined as he had little to unpack because he was a minimalist. Katsuki Bakugo stared daggers at him, especially when his mom came and gave him a huge hug. Hayoka Jiro and her parents appreciated the help as she was moving to a music studio. Itsuka Kendo just chuckled and carried most of her stuff in one trip on her own. But she did thank him for the offer. Fumikage Takoyami politely declined, and Izuku was introduced to Dark Shadow, whom Izuku wanted to nerd out on, as sentient quirks were rare as hell. Momo. All that was left was whom he had been genuinely waiting for, and she arrived with six moving vans. Momo emerged from the limo, he could see May and Melissa in the back. He walked over and kissed her quickly before leaning in to say hello to the girls. He could not help but laugh as only one van and the limo left to take them to their dorms. Darling, I think you may have overpacked. Momo shot him a dazzling smile. Nonsense, my dear, I just need to decide what furniture I want after seeing the space. Well, then, let me escort you to a space smaller than one of your closets. Oh, by the way, Brighton and Bakugo here as well. Momo immediately frowned. What the heck is he doing here? I thought I should warn you, but at least we are on the same floor. And they are not on that floor. Well, there is that. She leaned in close. Well, with us being on the same floor, it will be easy for you to come to my room. There is that. Well, let us get you settled so we can meet May and Melissa for dinner. May and Melissa. They pulled up in front of their dorms well past even the business courses but were satisfied. Where most of the other dorms were tall structures, theirs had a main building with several other smaller ones spread out around. The smaller building was private workshops that two students would share. May and Melissa had already requisitioned one and had been granted their request. Their rooms were a decent size and near each other, came stock with drafting tables and ample storage. They met their lab neighbors, a young man named Louis Nichols. He was tall and lanky with a messy top of brown hair and seemed to share May's love of goggles. The other was a shorter girl with long spiky red hair who introduced herself as Washu Haki. May settled her stuff quickly because most of it had been blown up. Melissa was easy as most of her property had been shipped from my island. 
They had only found six trackers when they had gone over everything. They piled back into the limo and headed to the one of dorms, Momo and Izuku. After having several different items brought in, Momo made her decisions, and the movers went to work bringing everything in and placing them according to her instructions. A few maids followed and began to hang up the clothing and finish the unpacking. The decorations were being placed when May and Melissa arrived. You know, Momo, I would say I forget how rich you are, but that would be impossible after living with you after the incident, Melissa said. Momo pouted a little. Father offered, and mother insisted, how was I supposed to say no? Besides, with everything decided, we can go to dinner. Good, because I am hungry and want to get this done so I can get to the baby making, May said with a bounce. The restaurant. Izuku laughed as they walked downstairs and headed off into the night. They went to Tatami Shushi restaurant near the school as they were settled and after placing their orders. Momo motioned for May to place the device in the center of the table. May smiled and set it down, the device would make remote listening impossible. So, what is going on? Melissa asked. Is Izuku going to spill the beans on whatever he has been hiding? May said. Izuku raised an eyebrow. Look, I know you are hiding something, but I am relieved that you have obviously told Momo what it is. So, is this where you tell us what is going on? I have my theories. Melissa looked between the three. I mean, yeah, I know there is something you are not telling us, but I figured you would when you were ready. What is your theory, May? Izuku asked. You are the boy who jumped off Momo's tower a while ago, and that strange radiation has something to do with what is standing in front of us in your quirk. Momo smiled. Melissa was slightly shocked. Izuku just smiled. God damn, girl, you are brilliant. Yes, I am, well, am I right? She smirked. Yes, you are. I did jump off the roof that night, and I died. The radiation did save me. I want to tell you everything because I trust you. If we disagree at the end of this, all I ask is that you keep it to yourself. I promise to listen, and for Momo's sake, if I disagree, I won't say anything, Melissa said. Obviously, she is on board with whatever is about to happen here. I'll listen. As long as you are not about to destroy the world, I can keep quiet. May said, leaning forward. Funny you should say that the world won't be blown up, but there is a possibility it will burn if we fail. Izuku did a quick telepathic search to ensure no one was listening to them before he began. I was born quirkless when I was four and a half. Hell, it was November 12th. A Thursday, my parents took me to a doctor, and after an x-ray of my pinky, a second joint was detected. I would never have or get a quirk. I had always dreamed of being a hero. I was devastated. I don't remember much else about that day, but I asked my mom if I could still be a hero, and she said no. Melissa knows, I am sure, what that means to others around you when they find out you are quirkless. A sad look crossed Melissa's face as she looked down at her hands. Everyone treats you differently. Some treat you like the plague, others ignore you, some bully you, and I think the one thing I hated the most was being treated like I was crippled. Like I had lost my legs and couldn't do anything, or I couldn't be expected to do anything. But thankfully, with my father being who he is and my island being the place that is, I didn't have to suffer as badly as other kids I would talk to online. Izuku smiled. What was your handle? I was dreaming green. OMG, I remember talking to you. I was tropical lab coat. I remember you too, you would post the craziest things, but it was so passionate. You and your hero talk would make me laugh so much. The two smiled and giggled as they continued for a few minutes before Momo placed a hand on Izuku's leg. Izuku blushed some before continuing. There is a chat room that is buried deep, and you must get an invite, and there is a whole process before they let you in, but quirkless people from all over the world are there, and we talk about problems we have and experiences. Discrimination, good things, etc. Some older people there try to help the younger ones by telling us tips and tricks to get by and places to go where it is alright. There are even some small communities where almost the entire place is quirkless residents. Did either of you know there is a marriage website for quirkless? But that is not the point. I was not sheltered from the abuse. Instead, my father up and left after the diagnosis, and my friend, already on his way to being an asshole, just decided to do it at warp speed. I was abused and ridiculed, and no one did anything. Teachers looked away, and students joined in. If I reported it, they would tell me how it was my fault or that I was the instigator looking for attention. My mom, well, she tried for a bit, then she just gave up. Then she left and went to live with my dad in America. My tormentor had been beating me down for 12 years. I was on the edge. The day I jumped, he told me to take a swan dive off the roof and wish for a quirk in the next life. I was wandering home only to be attacked by a villain, All Might saved me. Now I admire All Might, worship would be a better description. When he went to leave, I jumped on his leg, which is how we ended up on top of the Ayurazu building. I asked him if I could still be a hero without a quirk, and he said no. They were shocked, and Melissa was pissed. How could Uncle Might say such a thing? I just broke, it had all become too much, no one cared, not my parents, I had no friends, nothing. Now my idol had just pissed on my dreams as well. He left me up there on the roof, and I just decided it would be better to take the advice. Take a swan dive off the roof and hope for the next life to improve. So, you jumped, May said. Izuku nodded. I know that you all have seen the video, now, for the next part, it would be easier to show you than tell you. 
What do you mean? They asked before Melissa could. Like this, he said directly into their minds. May, you are a telepath as well. Melissa, have you read our minds? Izuku, no, I have no idea what you are thinking now. I could, but you deserve your privacy. That is why I told you about my youth instead of showing you. May, do you track us? Izuku, no, the only one I have a link with is Momo. Momo, I agreed to it after he told me everything. It is more like an emergency call feature, which is how he knew you two were under attack that day. Those people had jammed all other communications. We use it to talk sometimes. Izuku, I am also an empath and have used it to scan you two looking for deception. Melissa, how do we know you aren't influencing us? Izuku, now you don't, but after I show you both and bear myself to you, I hope I will have your trust. May, and if we tell you to go pound sand, you men and black us. Izuku, no, I understand if you want nothing to do with me. If you work against me, we will have to cross that bridge when we get there. That is why I spend all that time earnestly talking to you guys after the attack. We got to know each other before, but it was more of I was your guy's friend's boyfriend thing. Melissa, true. May, that is accurate. Izuku, so, knowing what you have done so far, do you want the rest? Melissa, May, yes. Momo, hold on to something, girls, because it is about to get out of this world. Melissa, to say she was stunned would have been an understatement of all time. The world was sitting on the shoulders of the man across from her. The world was about to burn, and he said no, not for his sake, not for humanity necessarily, but because Momo had shown him kindness once long ago. That Izuku's world had been so dark, so black, that if it hadn't been for that one light in the darkness, it would have burned. Izuku had left nothing back, he bared how empty and broken he was, the therapy sessions constantly day and night with Jean. The anger, the hurt, the truth about her uncle might and his quirk, the animosity between the two of them. Her uncle also hurt part of her, he never told her, he knew of her dream and could have made it come true. She knew it was bitterness talking, but still, it hurt. But for Izuku, his solution was not to forcibly change people but to try and lead them to a new tomorrow. A tomorrow he wanted to build with him from what she and May could invent, what they could create to change the world and make it all better. Melissa was an inventor, every inventor dreamed of changing the world. Making it a better place and sitting across from her was someone who could burn the world, but instead, they placed their faith in her. Melissa was quirkless like he used to be. The fate of the world was being placed in her hands. He believed in her that much. She would reward that faith and show this world and all her quirkless siblings out there that they could rise above and be leaders for the future. Part of her wondered, could Izuku change that? Could he take the quirkless and remake them like he was made? May, she sat back in her chair. There were things out there beyond the normal realm. This phoenix force was just one of them. It could burn the world and restart it simply by opening a door. It had done so twenty times before. Now the world was to be burned again, but Izuku had said they could be better than the world could be saved and that the four could lead that change. Izuku and Momo would lead the change through action and heroics. She and Melissa would lead the change through technology to advance the human fucking race. May's mind raced with ideas too many for her to grasp. Her mind was on fire, her body was heating up. She wanted to build, create, love, live, and change the motherfucking world. But, she had to make sure to create a way to protect the world. Izuku was just a regular person, after all. She would have to create a way to stop him if he decided to burn it all. Izuku, can you hear me? Yes, May. If you direct your thoughts and call, I will be able to hear you most time. I want to do this, but I am telling you now. I will be working on a way to stop you if you decide to burn it all down. If you conclude it is too far gone, the world needs a reset. I will fight against it. I want you to know I will not just shrug and say, well, we tried. If I am going down, I am going down swinging. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. I understand that, May. And I expect nothing less from you. Also, I want to help you develop something to stun me or knock me out. In case things go dark. It is the most beautiful thing about you, May, that fire, that passion. Then I am in, you son of a bitch. I am, in, support course dorms. May and Melissa walked into their dorms do not say much till they had gathered into Melissa's room and set up their anti-surveillance device. Well, we are in the pool's deep end now, Melissa said. That we are, girly. I should tell you that I told him that I was in but that I was also going to find a way to stop him if he decided that the world couldn't be saved, and he was going to burn it all down. Melissa frowned a little. What did he say? He expected nothing less and would help me out with it. That's a little surprising, but at the same time seems like him. He doesn't want to take away our free will, he wants people to follow willingly. Will you help me? Probably, but I would be more concerned with it falling into enemy hands. We need to do that for everything we invent. I want to focus on safety and security protocols first. I don't want villains or our enemies running around with our stuff. That makes sense, I agree. I also want to work out some shielding so those out there cannot detect when he goes all phoenix. I want to study this cosmic entity but avoid getting attacked every time we do so. Also, if he needs to go all out, we need a way to help keep that hidden for as long as possible. So essentially, safety and security. Devices, him, and us. We need a way to defend ourselves when we get attacked again. Jean can't come to save us again. Okay, let's focus on defense before we go on offense. Melissa smiled, and slowly a far-off look came to her eyes. May, would you mind sleeping here tonight? This is all a lot to take in and. It's all good, I was going to ask if I could sleep here anyway. 
It's a lot to take in, and knowing our friend is having sex with someone that can snuff the world if he has a bad day. Yea, that's a lot as well. Momo and Izuku. Izuku walked Momo to her door. They stood there momentarily before Momo opened it and pulled them inside. The door closed and locked as they found each other's lips. Thank you for telling them, she said as they broke apart momentarily. It needed to be done, and it feels better to have them on board and all of us on the same page. Izuku then shared his conversation with Mei. Are you okay with that? I am going to have to be. The type of people we will attract will not just sit there and shrug if I decide to burn it all. I don't expect that of anyone, not even you. Even if we try our best, that failure is most definitely on the table, it is likely the outcome. But that doesn't mean we can't go down swinging. Momo smiled, I will fight for you and with you till the end, Izu. I love you. Now kiss me, you fool. Izuku smiled and kissed her deeply as they started shedding their clothes before collapsing on the bed. They lost themselves in a tangle of limbs and sec. Tonight was a good night. Tomorrow was Sunday, an excellent time to get to know their classmates more. Introduce Mina and Momo, they could also get to know Shoto more. Many of their classmates seemed nice enough. The truth is that all armies needed members, and a revolution needed to start somewhere. What better place than here? What better time than now? Momo began kissing her way down his chest. Well, tomorrow. Tonight was for Momo and him. Day 1. Izuku awoke before his alarm. Slowly, he stretched, having returned to his room late after spending the evening with Momo. He reached over and shut off the alarm to prevent it from sounding and went to the shower. As he wiped the steam from the mirror, he stared at his reflection momentarily. Day 1. Now let's see how this goes. Momo went downstairs to find Izuku in the kitchen, setting down a plate for her. She walked over and kissed his cheek. For me. Izuku laughed. No, it is for my other girlfriend. SHHH I am not supposed to tell anyone. Momo gave him a fake pout. Well, she should have got down here first. Momo took a seat and began to eat. The meal was large, with four eggs, hash browns, multiple ham steaks, salad, and pancakes. Izuku set down a glass of milk and her favorite tea. Don't think we will have to use our quirks today but figured better safe than sorry. He said as he took a seat next to her with his meal. The two didn't speak verbally but chose to continue their conversation mentally. The sound of two girls going a w w w. Behind them, Izuku turned and saw Mina and Toru, well, her floating uniform at least. Izuku telepathically asked Momo if she had enough food, to which she stated she was quite satisfied with the morning offering. There is plenty extra if you girls want some. Izuku said. Really? Toru said with a bounce. Izuku nodded as the girls smiled and grabbed some food joining the couple. So, how long have you two been together? Mina asked as she took a bite of her eggs. Momo smiled and lightly touched Izuku's hand about about nine months. She then kissed Izuku's cheek. How did it happen? Did he swoop you off your feet? Toru said Izuku watched as the food just disappeared. Momo laughed lightly, sort of. We bumped into each other on the street. I almost fell, and he caught me. He went to leave, but he came back and asked if he could take me and my friends to get something to eat. Sadly, we had just eaten, then he asked me for lunch. Another time he said, once again, forgive my forwardness, but I know I would kick myself if I didn't say anything. Izuku blushed some, you remember what I said. It was quite the impression, she responded. Smooth moves there. Izuku, Mina said with a giggle, Izuku blushed more, making the giggle turn into a laugh. They talked some more when they finished Toru, and Mina offered to put the dishes in the dishwasher as Izuku had cooked for them. Soon they were making their way out the door, Izuku saw Shoto and called out to him, asking if he wanted to walk with them. Shoto tilted his head and asked, do you not know the way to class? The girls were somewhat confused, Izuku smiled and responded. No, we were hoping that you did. They watched as Shoto seemed to think about this, very well, then follow me. I shall make sure that we get to class. I wanted to know if you knew the warning signs of the floor becoming lava. I would like not to be caught unaware. Sorry, it's a spontaneous event, you just have to remain vigilant, Izuku said with a straight face. Confusion spread amongst the girls even more. Very well, he said, walking ahead and monitoring the ground as he did so. Momo grabbed Izuku's hand, what in the world was that about? Yeah, bro, you need to explain that like a SAP, Mina said. I am so confused, Toru added. Izuku recounted his exchange with Shoto and his sister when he helped them move in. So, he honestly believes that the floor can become lava like we are five or something, Mina said. Izuku shrugged honestly, at first, I thought he was joking, but I honestly have no idea. They were joined on their walk by Achako and Mina's friend Ijiro. As they approached the door, the thought of why it was so large crossed everyone's mind. They could hear Ida chastising someone, you should not put your feet on the desk. It is disrespectful to all the students who came before us and those who will come after us. Who gives a fuck? Four eyes. You better mind your business before I murder you. Murder me. Are you sure you want to be a hero who speaks like that? What the fuck did you just say? Shoto opened the door and peeked in before turning to Izuku. The floor seemed safe. Izuku noticed that Shoto gave a small smile as he turned and walked in. That son of a gun, he isn't on it. The group was the last to arrive. Momo and Izuku took seats next to each other near the front, with Mina and Toru taking the seats behind them. Everyone had taken their seat and were making light chit-chat about who their homeroom teacher would be when the door opened. The class turned and saw it most of them assumed to be a homeless person who may be the Hitoshi's father by the bags under their eyes. 
Dude, I didn't know your dad was a teacher here, Denki said to the teen with purple hair and eyes with dark circles under his eyes that matched the man walking in. No, neither did I, and he is not my dad. Stop talking. If you are here to make friends go home, at least you were all in your seats. I am Shota Aizawa, you may refer to me as Aizawa or Sensei. You are not here to make friends or to socialize, do that on your own time. When you are on my time, you are here to learn to be pro heroes. Now grab the PE uniforms in your desk head and meet me on the athletic fields in 10 minutes or be expelled. Izuku paused for one second before grabbing his uniform, Momo followed suit. Hey guys, I highly doubt he is joking, he said over his shoulder as the couple ran out the door, he noticed Bakugo and Brighton were already moving. Nina and Toru shook off their shock and followed the rest of the class springing to life. Minus eight minutes later, the last member of the class joined the rest on the athletic field. Not bad, glad you lot at least know to hustle. Achako raised her hand. Yes, Ms. Uraka. Um, sir, aren't we going to miss orientation and meeting with our guidance counselors? Unnecessary orientation is a waste of time, you are all here to become heroes. Why do you need to meet with a guidance counselor? Unless you are lost, are you lost, Ms. Uraka? Achako's eyes narrowed for a moment, no, sensei. Good, now we are going to perform an assessment test, the same one you have performed all your lives, but unlike the illogical reasoning or lies that everyone is created equal, they give you will get to use your quirks. Mr. Midoriya, you scored tops in the written and practical step up to the circle. Izuku stepped into the circle on the ground as Aizawa tossed him a ball. How far could you throw a ball in school? Izuku gave a weary smile, 15 meters. Aizawa looked over Izuku's impressive build, weigh this time, do it using your quirk. The class also needed clarification on Izuku's statement, with, of course, the exception of Momo. Looking at the ball, he wrapped it in his telekinesis and just tossed it over his shoulder, flying off out of sight. Aizawa raised an eyebrow looking at a device in his hand before he turned and showed it to the class, 1256 meters. There were some very responses for the class, most of them loud, Brighton sneered but said nothing, and Bakugo just ground his teeth and muttered, fucking Deku. Mina looked like she was about to explode with excitement, but Izuku quickly caught her attention and shook his head at her. Mina stopped and even grabbed Toru's arm to stop her as well. Unfortunately, Denki said, dude, this is going to be so much fun. Without missing a beat, Aizawa's very faint smile danced across his lips. Fun, Mr. Kaminari, then how about whoever scores the lowest will be expelled for showing minimal potential? Hitoshi got extremely nervous, and Toru suddenly said, wait, how is that fair? It is only the first day. Aizawa rubbed his eyes. Life is not fair, Ms. Hagakure. Natural disasters, villain attacks, disease, what quirk you are born with, none of that is fair. Now children, let's get to it, so I can get someone's expulsion paperwork filled out. Izuku placed his hand on Toru's shoulder, and subtly using his empathy, he calmed the invisible girl down. Just do your best, Toru, if you do, I am sure you won't be expelled. Test 1, 50 meter dash. Izuku, not wanting to call down a strike on the school, decided not to use the power cosmic to boost himself. He lost his race to Katsuki, who used his explosions to launch himself down the track. Katsuki was rather pleased that he beat Izuku, but his mood soured when Ida beat his time, and the Brighton Freedom took his place at the line. With a smile, he stepped to the line, and in a blink, he was across the line. The bots could barely register the time of 0.2 seconds. Izuku blinked again. Was that super speed? That is way beyond Ida, I couldn't even track it. Test 2, Grip Test. Momo created a vice to destroy the device, and Izuku used his telekinesis to do the same. He smiled when Katsuki did not even place into the top 5, Itsuka, Rikido, and Mizo did amazing. He paid particular attention to Brighton, who scored below average. He was surprised when Itoshi walked over to Itsuka. That was impressive, Kendo. Thanks, my quirk is more suited for strength than speed. Nice, would you squeeze this for me? He said as he handed her his test meter. Why would? Itsuka gave went vacant, and she took the meter and did just what he asked. She seemed to return to her senses as she handed him the meter. What just happened? The rest of the class turned to their teacher. I allow it. Itoshi walked over and placed his hand on her shoulder. Hey, sorry about that. If you want, I will explain later, and you can even deck me if you want. Itsuka nodded. Test 3, standing long jump. Katsuki cleared the pit, Izuku cleared it just a little past him, then Brighton did the same to Izuku. In truth, the whole class did rather well. But Izuku was confused again about Brighton, he stood at the pit and was on the other side, just past Izuku's mark. Test 4, repeated side steps. With the aid of springs, Momo did great, Tsu for apparent reasons, and surprisingly Toru rounded out the top 3. Test 5, distance run. Izuku loved his girlfriend, but she was a straight-up cheater, a solar-powered scooter, he just smiled at her as she zipped past him without a care in the world. He was amazed when he saw Hitoshi zipping on the same contraption. Ida, well this was his time to shine, and he did take the top spot. Momo, what happened? I don't know. He came up and said hello, I responded and made him a scooter. Izuku reached out and touched his girlfriend's mind and could feel what had happened. He quickly set up blocks to stop that from happening to her again. Katsuki was fuming, he wasn't taking the top spot. What the hell? He was supposed to be the next number one, but somehow a girl with invisibility had managed to do better than him in the sidestep test. 
Test 6, seated toe touch. Mina and Tor won easily, as the only way they could get closer to the ground was if they managed to merge with it. Most surprisingly, Koji did almost as well, to everyone's surprise. Test 7, sit-ups. Izuku was doing well due to how Jean had rebuilt him and his training regimen. He also admired how everyone except Hitoshi, who struggled, was in such good shape. In the end, Izuku stopped and put up a good number. To Izuku's confusion, Brighton could have done better than Izuku thought he would. Test 8, ball throw. Achaka won with infinity, Katsuki tried to kill the ball, and he got one of the top scores in class, behind Achako, Izuku, Momo, and Shoto, and surprisingly Koji beat everyone except Achako and Itoshi when a bird came down and grabbed his ball and flew off. The shy giant gave everyone his timid smile and walked out of the circle. Itoshi had called over to Achako, who responded then, with the same zombie-like look, walked over and touched the softball for him as he just let it float off. What caught Izuku's attention was when Brighton was about to step into the circle, the Aizawa said that Brighton had to remain in the circle. Then there was no super speed but a somewhat subpar throw. Everyone sat nervously as Aizawa tallied up the scores. Now, let's get to it. The scores manifested on a hologram in front of the class. Tora was last, she had done her best, she was about to cry when she heard her classmates complain to Aizawa. She felt two hands gently placed on her shoulder, and Mina and Izuku were trying to comfort her. Izuku looked over at Momo, who nodded as she stepped forward. Mr. Aizawa, are you really about to expel Toru? I told you all what would happen to whoever came in last. Sir, was that not a logical ruse to push us to do our best? I noticed the small smile when Denki spoke up. And if it was, I feel personally that there are better ways to get us to do our best other than psychological trauma. It is my job to make you into heroes, not to hold your hand from the realities of the world. That is where you are wrong, it is your job, Mr. Aizawa, Izuku said, coming to stand next to Momo. Your job is to teach us and to give us the best chance to succeed, not to step in and shatter something someone has worked for in just one afternoon over some stupid high school tests. My job is to make sure you don't die out there once you leave these grounds, to remove those with no potential, Mr. Midoriya. Today is not that day, so settle down. The threat of expulsion was indeed used to motivate all of you today, but it was also a real threat. If any of you had not tried your best, you would have been expelled today. Mr. Shinso, today you placed higher than Ms. Hagakure by the nature of your quirk, which is commendable, but your physical capabilities are atrocious. A hero cannot be defined by their quirk alone, as none of you are all might in disguise. You need to be able to defend yourself and others without your quirk. Whether you aim to be number one, a support or rescue hero, no one can afford to be a one-trick pony. Ms. Hagakure, you are not being expelled today. After you all change, head back to class and collect your syllabus, you are done for the day. Boys locker room. The boys were changing idle chit-chat, passing back and forth, Izuku looked over at Shoto, who was changing silently. Hey, Shoto, why didn't you use your fire during the drills? Izuku asked. He saw Shoto sigh and looked over at him. I don't use my fire side because it belongs to father, I don't want to give him the satisfaction. Izuku could sense the emotions coming off Shoto, he walked over and placed a hand on his shoulder. You know that your fire doesn't belong to him, just as much that your ice doesn't belong to your mother. They are your powers, not theirs. My mom is a minor telekinetic and abandoned me along with my father. My power is an improvement of hers, it is not hers. It is mine. You should think about the type of person you want to be, not what anyone else wants. Now come on, let's get some lunch. Shoto looked at him with a peculiar look, food would be good. That way, Fayumi won't worry. Izuku saw most of the guys looking at them, you guys are more than welcome to join, the more, the merrier. I must decline, as Tenya has already agreed to have lunch with me, Brighton said. Ah, yes, Brighton, let us head out, Tenya said with a stiff chop. I would rather eat my boot, fucking Deku, Bakugo said under his breath as he slammed his locker and stalked off. Shoto looked at Izuku, he doesn't seem to like you. Yay, the feeling is mutual, come eat with us, Hitoshi. You don't mind if I used my power on your girlfriend. You didn't do anything bad to her, so yeah, that's fine, your quirk is cool. It would be amazing in hostage situations. Yay, bro, you could get the villain just to surrender or deactivate the bomb, Ijiro added. I'll join you, Midoriya. Hitoshi was surprised by Izuku's reaction, but it was one of the first times someone had not called his quirk villainous. I could eat. Soon the other guys decided to join, and they headed to the cafeteria as a group meeting with the girls along the way. Girls locker room. Momo, do you want to come and get some food with Toru and me? Mina asked as she stepped out of the shower wrapped in a towel. Or do you have plans with Izuku? No, I am free for lunch, he will eat with the guys from class. It's a good chance to mingle and everything. We could always join up with them and make it a class thing. I would be down for either, I would like to get to know everyone better, Itsuka said as she sat down on the bench. Sue stopped dressing and held her finger to her chin, thinking, Ribbit, a class lunch sounds good. I want to make more friends. If we go to the cafeteria, I would love to go. I am on a budget, Achako said with a blush. Food is food, Kayoka said. Hey, Momo, thanks for sticking up for me, I thought he was going to expel me, Toru said. Yay, that was bullshit, Kayoka added. It was no problem, Toru. We have to stick together, Momo said, pulling her hair into her signature ponytail. 
Well, thanks anyway, we should set up a group chat to talk more, Toru said, holding up her phone. It would be cool if we could also work out together, Itsuka said. Only if you help with learning some hand-to-hand, -hand, Achako said. I think I really should learn some with my quirk. I thought you wanted to go rescue. Mina said, I do, but I was talking with Tsu, and she told me that sometimes you have to go into an active battle zone to rescue, and some villains target the rescue heroes specifically. Hero, rescue heroes die a lot because they don't know how to fight, so I learned some martial arts myself. Ribbit, that makes sense, yeah we should work out together. It will be better than doing it alone, Mina said. Itsuka smiled at Ochako, I would be happy to help in any way I can. Soon all the girls were agreeing and sharing contact info. Mina and Toru teased Momo at her home screen picture of her and Izuku on the beach. Momo blushed a little before pulling her phone back, scrolling through her photos, and flashed the two a shot of Izuku wrapped in a towel flexing in the mirror. She laughed at their reactions. Damn girl, that is nice, Mina said. Momo smiled. How many of them will agree with the plan we have? Soon they were on their way to meet up with the boys. After lunch, as the rest of class want to return to the dorms, Momo and Izuku excused themselves and headed to the support department to see their friends. Along the way, their finger intertwined, they stole kisses and enjoyed the stroll. Standing in front of the heavy metal doors, they heard the familiar sound of May cackling wildly and Melissa attempting to restrain her. After being granted access, they found the duo in the corner of the building with a half-formed device on the bench. New baby May, Izuku asked. The girls turned and looked at him. May smiled wildly, Melissa looked at him. Her gaze seemed to linger on him longer than usual, he quietly dismissed it. Momo however took note. Izuku, just the man I wanted to see, I had an idea, and I believe this will help us with our little detection problem. It's rough, but we should have a working prototype if we can get the teacher to let us move the project to our private workshop. Momo noticed that Melissa kept looking over at Izuku. She wanted to ask him something but needed to figure out how to approach it. Momo decided to watch and see what would happen, she would step in if needed. She pulled herself back to the conversation as the girls explained that the device would disrupt the energy readings around Izuku when he went all special. The two were pitching it as a portable anti-surveillance device. They started talking about materials to Momo, the heiress was deep in thought before she began to counter May's requests with different options. Soon the three girls debated feverishly over this, Izuku stepped back and smiled, watching it unfold. The only thing that stopped the argument was when the head of the support department power loader came over, he was eyeing Izuku intently. Izuku looked over at the teacher, he could feel the trepidation cut with a feeling of aggression radiating off the teacher. Well, hello, professor. Sorry if they are disrupting anything, they get passionate about projects. Well, in one day, Miss Hatsum has proved to be quite excitable when something catches her attention, but what she has submitted in just a day is amazing. The shield is a good calming influence. But I must wonder what two heroic course students are doing here. We finished with our classes for the day and simply wanted to check on our friends, I wanted to make sure that they were adapting well, being welcomed and everything. You were in the booth when I took my second exam, weren't you? Power Loader's gaze narrowed behind his mask. I was, it was an interesting display on several levels. I was unaware of your connection to these two. They are friends of mine. Please make sure to pass that information on when you make your report. Power Loader nodded and handed a pack of papers. That is the signed permission for them to move their project to their private labs. I have to ask you and your other friend to leave as class is still in session. Izuku nodded and took the packet. He walked over and stopped the debate by handing the paperwork to Melissa and taking Momo's hand to lead her out. Once they were away from the class, Izuku whispered into Momo's ear. Momo's cheeks flamed as she nodded. Izuku took her hand and led her back to the dorms. Day 2. The great thing about waking up with Momo was while waking up with Momo. This morning, the two young lovers barely made it downstairs to grab some energy bars and protein shakes as their morning tryst continued to the shower. As they raced across campus, they barely made it into class with a minute to spare. Mina gave them a knowing smirk as they took their seats. You two missed breakfast today, she said coyly. We woke up late, Momo said quickly. Must have forgotten to set the alarm, Izuku added. I am sure that is what happened, Toru giggled. Before the conversation could continue, Mr. Aizawa made his entrance. He laid out the plans for the day of regular classes before adding that today would be their first heroics class which would take place after lunch. He ran down the list of announcements for the day before he walked out as ectoplasm entered. Welcome students to the wonderful world of math, he said. The groans from most of the students were amusing, except for Momo and Tenya, who seemed excited. Math gave way to English with President Mike, which gave way to classic literature with the pro-hero calligraphy. Finally, the lunch bell rang, and they all shuffled out. Lunch was a pleasant. May and Melissa were there after some introductions to the group. It was a rather lively affair. May wanted to drag Kayoka and Itoshi to the design studio to make babies, causing the purple-haired duo to blush. A quick explanation later had managed to calm them down some. Melissa was talking to Toru about having her come down so Melissa could create a suit for her, so she wouldn't have to be naked. Toru was overly excited about the prospect and the fact that she learned that such a thing was possible. Momo assured Toru that it would work as Melissa had created a suit for her, allowing her creation to work without having to run around, making the Gen 1 Midnight costume look tame. 
The table laughed when Izuku commented that he would still like to see that suit one day while Momo furiously blushed and playfully smacked him. As lunch finished, the group was making their way back to class. The topic turned to who would be their heroics teacher, and as they entered, it was the topic for most of the course. Everyone was seated with their eyes on the door. The last voice Izuku wanted to hear boomed from outside the door. Here I am, entering the room like a normal person. The class erupted with comments about how All Might had just walked in, his choice of Silver Age costume, and how cool he would be their heroic teacher. Yes, children, I am going to be your heroics teacher, but before that can happen, you can't begin your heroic careers in your school uniform. The far wall slid open revealing metal cases. Now grab your hero uniforms, get changed, and meet me at the training ground, Gamma. Now I am exciting like a normal person. With a gust of wind, he was gone. Everyone grabbed their cases and made their way to the locker rooms. Momo just whispered a brief assurance in Izuku's ear before they got changed. Izuku opened his case and smiled at the letter from May and Melissa telling him to kick some ass for them. He did a brief sweep of the costume, looking for anything unusual. To his surprise, there was only one tracking device, and that was on the case itself, his outfit was clean. Izuku found his way to the training grounds and quickly spotted his girlfriend in her hero outfit, red with white trim and armor reinforcement. A quick access computer for chemical comps was on her wrist with a floating heads-up display. It hugged her figure nicely, but she didn't have to rip her costume whenever she needed to make something. She walked over and looked at him with a smile. I like it, Izu. Izuku was dressed in dark green combat boots, with black leather and Kevlar weave pants, two-tone leather, and a Kevlar shirt black in the center fabric with a gold phoenix. The arms and shoulders were dark green, and he had a half-trench leather coat with green fire running down the arms and the same gold phoenix logo on the back. A green utility belt with first aid supplies completed his look. Google Vulcan Phoenix for an idea of the inspiration for the look. You look pretty good yourself there, gorgeous, he responded. He then managed to look at all their classmates. They all had exciting costumes, Achako came over and complimented the couple. She was shy about her outfit until they complimented her, which seemed to lift her spirits. Izuku walked over to Mina, like the print Mina, your costume looks good. Thanks, Izuku, you look pretty cool yourself, she responded, what's the symbol mean? It's a phoenix. That is great, she said with a smile, she caught him sneaking at her cleavage, and he caught her checking out his muscles. Tora came bounding over well a pair of gloves and shoes, which made Izuku blush a little as he realized that she was naked, which Tora noticed and giggled. Momo was talking with Achako and Ida when you looked divine, Ms. Yeyurazu, she turned and saw Brighton. Brighton Freedom's costume was a deep blue, with a silver trim bodysuit, gloves with armor reinforcement, and a silver cape to finish it off. Thank you, she said before returning to Achako and Ida. You look cool, Brighton, Achako said with a smile. Yes, Brighton, I think the look fits you, Momo. Tenya said. Momo looked at Ida. Sorry, Ida, I am going to join Izuku. Excuse me. As she walked over, Sue fell into step with her. You okay, Momo? You seem agitated. I like your hero costume, by the way. Oh, thank you, Sue, I like yours as well. Brighton and I don't agree, that's all. Don't let it bother you. Okay, I won't pry, but if you need to talk, I am willing to listen, Sue replied. They say that clothes make the hero and all of you look great. Today we are going to engage in 2v2 combat with one team taking the role of villains who are guarding a bomb, and the other team will be heroes trying to thwart them. How will teams be decided? Ida asked. We will draw lots. All Might said with a smile. Is that the best way, sir? I can understand your concern, young Tenya, but heroes do not have the luxury of choosing whom they team up with within the field very often. This will represent that. Now, my little zygotes, let's get this dog and pony show started. Each team will have 10 minutes to before the exercise starts, so use that time wisely to plan your attack or defense. How do we win this thing? Bakugo asked. By incapacitating your opponents, heroes can win by using capture tape. Villains can also win by running out the clock. There will be a 10-minute time limit from the start of the exercise. At the end of each fight, we will choose an MVP for each Komabat trial. Bakugo grinned at the mention of being able to beat your opponents into submission. He smiled at Izuku, time to teach that damn Deku his place. The students all drew lots, and the matchups were announced. Izuku, Mina vs. Bakugo, Ida. Momo, Denki vs. Toru, Yuga. Brighton, Su vs. Achako, Rikido. Itoshi, Kayoka vs. Itsuka, Hijiro. Shoto, Koji vs. Fumikage, Mizo. Match 1. Izuku and Mina walked towards the building, Mina glanced over at him. Well, do you have a plan? I do, but feel free to offer your opinion. Trust me, Izuku, I have no problem speaking my mind. She said with a smirk, placing her hand on her hips. Izuku smiled, my bad, Bakugo is probably going to rush us and focus on me leaving Ida with the bomb. They will probably have it on the top floor and move all the stuff out of the way so Ida can use his speed. Izuku paused, thinking, how corrosive can you make your acid, as in, can you make it eat through the floor? Yeah, I can get it through concrete. Why? Okay, I can handle Bakugo, you go find the bomb and use your acid to make it so Ida can't take a straight line. If you can touch the bomb, I will join you and distract Ida while you secure the win. Sounds good, if I can capture Ida, I will go for it. 
I trust your judgment, Izuku flashed her a dazzling smile. Villains. Tenya Ida was not keen on portraying a villain in this exercise, but he would do his best to succeed. He had spent the entire time attempting to produce a plan with Bakugo but to no avail. All the explosive blonde would say was to guard the damn bomb while he handled Deku. Ida put together that he was referring to Izuku and that this was personal. He attempted to dissuade Bakugo from this and to focus on the exercise. The final straw was when Bakugo turned and shouted, I'm going to be the next number one four eyes. I don't need your help. Just sit here and watch my legend begin. Ida stopped and just went to work, preparing the room for the best defense he could. His mind wandered to his lunch with Brighton, where Brighton had expressed his concerns that Izuku was manipulating Momo and that he was worried about her. Ida and Brighton had met a few times over the years, and he got along with him rather well. Brighton had made his attraction to Momo rather apparent. It was something Ida could understand. Momo was quite gorgeous, intelligent, and from a very prestigious family. His mother had implied that Ida should attempt and approach her when she found out she was in his class, but that was tossed aside when he found that she was dating someone. He had told Brighton that he should do the same as meddling and their relationship needed to be revised. But Brighton had made a strong case that Izuku had been manipulating her. Honestly, he knew he was utterly ignorant about how relationships were to work from a personal perspective, but Momo didn't seem to be under any control. Begin. Izuku and Mina entered and began to make their way to the stairs. It was strangely silent. Then Izuku grabbed Mina and jumped back as an explosion came around the corner. Don't run from me, Deku. Izuku nodded at Mina, who raced to the second set of stairs. Who's running pumpkin? Izuku said, his voice dripping with venom. Bakugo growled and don't look down on me, you piece of shit. He dashed in and fired directly. You are not better than me. Were you hiding your quirk from me all this time? The smoke cleared into Bakugo's chagrin. Izuku stood there unharmed as he had erected a shield with ease. You see, Bakugo, I look down on you because I am taller than you, and you are a perfect example of what is wrong in this world. Also, I am better than you. Bakugo went to curse, but then his body stiffened, and Izuku wrapped him in his telekinesis. He pulled him right up to him and smacked him dismissively across the face. How fucking dumb are you to think I would go through my entire life hiding my quirk so I could play some sort of joke on you? He backhanded Bakugo in the same dismissive manner. That I would intentionally suffer all the bullshit you and that piece of shit school did to me just for a laugh, all the beatings and the burns so that I could what giggle at home about it. Another slap. Well, Bakugo, this has been fun. Good night, pumpkin. Izuku just smiled and walked away as Bakugo was helplessly tossed around the room into unconsciousness, then had his hands bound behind his back with capture tape. Young Bakugo has been eliminated. Mina had made her way to the top floor and was preparing her ambush when Ida's evil laugh and monologue made her laugh, revealing her position. She burst into the room, throwing acid on the floor in front of Ida, halting his assault. She slides along the floor continuing to their game of cat and mouse. Ida heard All Might's announcement and knew he had to take a risk as Izuku was on his way. When Mina sprayed her acid, he surprised her by leaping over as he came down with an axe kick. Mina slipped to the side and managed to open hand slap Ida, her hand covered with acid, and began to eat at his helmet. To everyone in the monitoring room, Mina tackled Ida to the ground landing a solid knee to the family jewels, then proceeded to capture the speedster as Izuku burst in. Young Ida has been captured, hero team wins. Mina jumped up and pumped her fist. Izuku sympathized with Ida as the boy was holding his jewels. Now that just isn't cricket, baby, never hit a man in the jewels, Izuku said with a fake British accent. That's why you should always protect the McNuggets, son. She replied, but sorry about that, Ida, I was going for your gut, she added sheepishly, rubbing the back of her head. I understand, Mina, just give me a moment, Izuku, please remind me to visit the support department after class. Izuku laughed, I think every guy will do the same thing. The trio eventually made their way into the viewing room, where Ida received an embarrassing clap from the boys. All Might cleared his throat, now, who should be the MVP of the match? Besides Ida's family jewels. Dinky asked as some laughter broke out. Momo raised her hand, I think the entire group should, minus Bakugo. Izuku had a plan which Mina agreed to, but she wasn't just going to sit back and be idle. She said she would and did just that when she saw an opportunity to capture Ida. Ida embraced his role as a villain even though he had misgivings about assuming the role. He was saddled with someone who would not listen or even attempt to work together. Also, Izuku may have gone overboard with Bakugo instead of just subduing him a little more quickly. A very good assessment, yes you all pass. Round 2. As Momo and Denki walked towards the building, she handed him some thermal goggles and instructed him to knock out the power when the situation started. It was a bit of a messy struggle, but they managed to subdue Toru, the invisible girl who knew how to scrap. With Momo creating reflective shields, they could deflect Yuga's naval lasers and capture the bomb. Momo was declared MVP, but Hugo rejoined the class as the round ended but said nothing while standing in the corner. Round 3. Much like Bakugo, Brighton wanted to avoid discussing strategy with Sue and pretty much ignored her. After trying for several minutes, Sue just gave up. 
the heroes entered the building and found their villains waiting on the third floor. When they unleashed all kinds of furniture at them to bury them, Sue went to leap away only to feel a sudden tug on her leg that slammed her back down. She was buried under the assault of office furniture. Hero team wins, bomb secured. All Might called out. Achako and Rikido were in shock as they turned and saw Brighton standing with his hand on the bomb. The villains quickly shook off their shock and went to unbury Sue. She had a gash on her head, but she shot an angry look at Brighton as Achako and Rikido helped her to the infirmary. Brighton was annoyed that he was not rewarded with MVP due to his lack of cooperation with Sue. Round 4 One of the most impressive matches during the trials involved Hitoshi and Kayoka, who faced a significant disadvantage in combat abilities. They had to rely on their creativity to overcome the challenge posed by Itsuka and Ijiro, who used hit-and-run tactics. Even when Hitoshi managed to take control of one of the villains, the other would quickly assault the mind-controlled individual to break free. However, Hitoshi's lack of physical preparation ultimately cost him the match, as Itsuka overpowered and knocked him out. Similarly, Kayoka struggled to break through Ijiro's hardening, which allowed the villains to double-team her and take her down. Nevertheless, Kayoka's impressive move of jamming her jacks into Itsuka's ears almost overtook her and earned her the MVP award. Round 5 Shoto initially planned to work alone, but he halted to engage in a conversation with Koji. Despite their social awkwardness, the dialogue between the two was intriguing. However, things worsened when Shoto and Fumikage, Dark Shadow engaged in a fierce battle, resulting in Shoto freezing the building and damaging numerous lights with Dark Shadow's power. Mizo succeeded in overpowering Koji, but everyone was shocked by the strength of the timid giant of Wano before he was eventually apprehended. Shoto's failure to utilize his fire ultimately led to the defeat of the hero team as time ran out. As a result, Fumi was awarded the MVP. After class, as class 1 returned to their dorm, they all started discussing the training when Shoto fell into step with Izuku and Momo. If I had used my fire, could we have owned today? Probably. Dark Shadow gets stronger in the dark. Your fire would have probably weakened him, Izuku said. If it had been real, people would have died. He responded. Momo sympathetically touched his shoulder. That is correct, Shoto. I don't want to use his fire. Remember what we talked about, Shoto. It's not his fire. It's yours. My mom's telekinesis versus my telekinesis. But this is also training so we can get better. I am not going to say don't let this bother you, but it should make you think. What if you encounter a villain immune to ice once you go pro? Shoto nodded and said nothing else on the way back to the dorms. The group's attention was redirected when Sue confronted Brighton about grabbing her leg during the ambush. Although he denied it, Sue didn't believe him and fled in frustration. This was the most animated they had seen her since they had met her a few days ago. Later that evening, everyone gathered in the dorms to prepare and eat dinner together, except for Bakugo and Brighton. Shoto remained quiet, mostly observing. It was a pleasant night as my classmates had the opportunity to get to know each other better. They did just that as people sat around the common room going over their homework and seeking help from their peers. They even had an impromptu game night of charades. Shoto smiled at his classmates' antics as they attempted to act out things for the prize of a plastic trophy that Momo made on the spot. As he walked off to bed, he couldn't stop thinking. What kind of hero did he want to be? And was it his fire? Momo and Izuku went to the support course dorms to meet with Mei and Melissa. The two walked, enjoying the early evening, their fingers intertwined. Upon arriving at the dorms, they were greeted by Melissa, who was waiting outside. Hey everyone, May is in the lab. I will lead you over, Melissa said. Momo noticed as her friend's gaze lingered on Izuku for a moment. She could tell that something was on Melissa's mind. How was your second day? Izuku asked. It went well. We didn't get much work in the lab today. It was more normal school stuff. They had us start looking through students' submittals so we could do a project. I am meeting with a few other first years to review their support requests. I should have some essential undergarments for Toru by tomorrow. It will take more time for the other stuff. But this way, she won't have to be completely naked. That's good, I am sure she will appreciate it, Momo said. They soon found themselves entering the lab where Mei was engrossed in the project. They had discussed the previous day. Izuku had walked over and was talking over the project with Mei seeing if he could offer any advice. Momo used this moment to place her hand on Melissa's arm and pull her to the side. Is something wrong, Mel? No, exactly. She replied. I have noticed you have been giving Izuku looks since the reveal. Melissa sighed deeply and said, everyone desires what they lack. If you're short, you crave height. If you have straight hair, you want curls, and so on. Izuku and I share a similar past, we were both quirkless until he was bestowed with extraordinary abilities. Being quirkless is challenging, and I greatly empathize with him. I can't help but wonder if he could grant me a quirk. It has been on my mind. I didn't think about that, Mel, I didn't even consider that impact would have on you. I wondered if how you looked at him had to do with something else. Like I thought you may have been attracted to him. Izuku is hot and intelligent, Momo, any girl would think so, but you mean more to me. I know that, Melissa, I wasn't upset by it. I know that one or more of the girls in my class have a thing for him. Jean told me this kind of thing would happen. Are you okay with that? It's alright for others to help Izuku if they have his best interest. 
Hizuku decided not to let the world suffer because of me. G mentioned that I am his primary anchor, and he must also have other anchors. If something happened to me, he could fall, and the Dark Phoenix could emerge. I don't want that to happen to the world or him. I'm not sure if he can bear it if that happens. For now, he must make friends and let others in. I was relieved when he told you in May that you supported him. However, I need to be more naive to believe everyone will feel the same way when sharing this information. So, you are okay with sharing your boyfriend. Izuku possesses exceptional strength and an unwavering spirit. His stamina is phenomenal in numerous aspects. I hold a deep affection for him, which he reciprocates. Moreover, I am confident of my place in his heart, which remains unchallenged. However, given my future commitments to heroics and running the company, I might only sometimes be able to provide him with the time and attention he requires. I hope you comprehend what I am trying to convey. I think I do, I won't lie and say that I am not attracted to him, but I would always put squash on any of those thoughts. I want to make sure you won't mind that I think about it a little more, your friendship and love mean more to me, Momo. Melissa, take your time and keep me updated. Regarding the quirk, it would be best to talk with him. Ultimately, he decides whether to do it if he's capable. However, would you be alright if he chooses not to do it even if he can? He empathizes with the pain of being quirkless in a society that values quirks. Knowing he possesses that ability, yet choosing not to aid the quirkless, would be a source of great anguish for me. It would also depend on his reasoning. If he could do it and told me no, there would be a solid reason. I do too. Let's ensure those two don't blow up the lab, may more than Izuku, but you understand. Melissa joined in as May and Izuku discussed the power source's stability. May was confident that the power source would be stable, while Izuku questioned why they weren't considering an alternative method. However, Melissa had the correct answer. The three of them continued to debate, and Momo found their arguments amusing. The second explosion of the night was particularly impressive. Ultimately, Melissa's answer was correct, which was a satisfying outcome for her. As the group went apart for the evening, Melissa pulled Izuku aside. Hey, Izuku, I wanted to talk to you about something. Do you think that maybe we could get together, Sarai? Is everything okay? Yes, everything is fine. I want to talk to you about something from dinner the other night and want some time to get all my thoughts in order before we do. Okay then, Melissa, Sari will be fine. We can set something up as we get closer. Thank you, Izuku. Achako. As Achako gazed upon the impressive spread of food before her, her eyes widened in curiosity. Despite Brighton's charm, something about him and the battle test gave her a bad feeling in her gut, as her father had always cautioned her to trust her instincts. However, she found solace in the company of her classmates, Hitoshi, Denki, Itsuka, and Ida, who were also present at the restaurant. Although she felt slightly out of place, Achako saw it as a chance to forge closer bonds with her peers and appreciate the restaurant's excellent cuisine. Brighton was pleasant enough to talk to but seemed to have a problem with Izuku. He let slip some subtle comments about Izuku's character and intentions toward Momo. This placed Achako on edge slightly as she hadn't noticed anything odd. She blushed some to herself as she had seen Izuku slipping into Momo's room late one evening but that was none of Achako's business. Most of the class had eaten lunch together the previous day, and the young couple seemed happy. Achako didn't understand the deal. Achako was on edge when she asked him what happened during the Tsu battle test. It is nothing to worry about, I highly question her future and heroics. It would seem her quirk may be better suited somewhere else. Achako, a girl from the countryside, felt a sense of condescension in his voice, like how city contractors or businessmen would speak to her parents. Despite not knowing too well, the girl had become one of her favorites. When Achako mentioned she didn't have much to move into the dorms, Izuku showed empathy and understanding by admitting he was in the same situation. He didn't offer pity but rather compassion and understanding. She watched Brighton flutter about talking to everyone, adapting to their interests, and offering some opportunity. A new game for Denki, a chance for Itsuka to meet a famous martial artist, and a rare book for Itoshi, he had offered to put in a good word for her parents with some construction job. That set off alarm bells, she hadn't told him her parent were in construction, she had only told Sue about it as they discussed family. There was no way that Sue would have shared that information with Brighton. He was playing a game, and Archako did not like people who played games. Say what you mean and mean what you say. This rich boy thought he was better than her and felt more intelligent than her. She was raised in the country but still made it into a school with a 2% acceptance rate. She had scored in the top 90% on the written test. She was not dumb or ignorant and was not about letting someone try and use her in some game. She would find out what this douchebag was up to and show him she was not one to be fucked with. Bakugo. Bakugo had made his way down to the kitchen, but the explosive teen was hungry and went to get something to eat. As he entered the kitchen, he saw Brighton sitting on the kitchen island, eating some curry. He responded to the rich prick's question with a grunt as he rummaged through the fridge for something. It wasn't until he heard the offer of spicy curry that Bakugo turned around and noticed that Brighton was sweating profusely as he ate. Do you like spicy curry? Why? Bakugo responded with all the civility of an angry Pomeranian. I ordered mild, and they gave me spicy, I can't eat it. Did you want it before I got rid of it? You came down here to get something to eat. I am just trying to be nice. Why would I want anything from you, and why, what do you want? Brighton smiled. 
to get rid of Izuku Midoriya. Now do you like spicy curry or not? Bakugo smirked, I could go for some. Day 3. Madam President. Momo sat at lunch rather pleased that she had been elected class president during homeroom, with her boyfriend elected her vice president. The morning classes had progressed rather well as she and her classmates sat down to eat lunch. Momo sat back and took in the scene of the whole lunch table, May and Melissa, Mina and Toru, and Shoto and Itsuga all sitting together. The girl who always felt lonely was leaving that in the past, as she was surrounded by others who shared her passion and desire to become a hero and her drive. She was laughing as Mina and Toru were already saying how their homework had mysteriously disappeared into the phantom zone when her musing was broken by the school alarms going off. Alert, alert security breach level 3, security breach level 3, all students report to the designated evacuation area, all students report to the designated evacuation area, this is not a drill, this is not a drill. The lunchroom erupted into immediate chaos as the student body began to panic. Izuku immediately wrapped himself and Momo in a telekinetic bubble and pulled them into the air, locating Mei and Melissa, he did the same. They quickly looked to the windows, expecting to see the paramilitary unit descending on the school, but she immediately noticed no such thing. Instead, the press seemed to be flooding through a destroyed gate. Izuku, it's the press. They are entering through a destroyed gate, which is troublesome in a different way. The gate's destruction seems way too much for a simple press member. I mean the quirk that would have to be used to destroy it in such a manner. She communicated telepathically. Izuku relayed the information to Momo, who created a bullhorn. Everyone calm down. It is just the press, we are students of the UA. Show that you know how to react. Hitoshi and Mizo, see if you can find Toru and make sure she is okay. Ida and Itsuka help to get everyone out in an orderly manner. Yes, ma'am, they responded in unison. Izuku immediately lowered his group to the ground and began sweeping telepathically throughout the building. Yes, this is precisely what we were looking for, perfect. A young master will be pleased. Before Izuku could lock down a position, the person was gone, it must be some teleporter. He relayed the info, there wasn't much they could do about it without revealing more of their hand, they were reluctant to do so as they were aware of the possible confrontational relationship between Izuku and the staff. Melissa supplied an option by having an anonymous report sent to the school. They said she would mention her findings about the gate as she could tell the truth of what she had seen via her quirk from the window. Izuku provided a general area where he sensed Melissa's thoughts to include in her tip. Momo was seeing her classmates and clearing the cafeteria. Thankfully, Toru had been found easily and was unhurt though she had been knocked to the ground. The group made their way outside before they had to split to their response zones. Izuku did a quick head count of their class, ensuring they were all present and informing Professor Midnight, who oversaw the evacuation grounds. Soon they were given the all-clear and returned to class. As they were walking back to class, they had heard from some of the general studies students that the press had harassed them about all might teaching at the school and had wanted to get a quote from them. The press had left them alone for the most part after they told them they were Gen Ed and All Might wasn't their teacher. Momo and Izuku were pulled into their first student council meeting per se, it was more of an introduction to the other elected officials. They bumped into the representatives of their sister class along the way boy with ice blue hair and black eyes introduced himself as the president of 1B Shota Naranjik. And his vice president was another boy with blonde hair and blue eyes whose false politeness tainted his introduction and his Nito Monoma. Nito shook hands with Momo. A disturbing look glanced through his eyes as he did so and he did the same with Izuku though it was confusion. The two presidents made small talk as they were making their way to the student council meeting while the two vice presidents had fallen into step behind them. So, Midoriya, what is your quirk? Nito said, his voice momentarily seeming to quaver with curiosity. Izuku raised an eyebrow and responded, tell me yours first. Nito smiled, why can I copy someone's quirk with a touch? Your class president has a fascinating quirk, while you seem to have a weak form of telekinesis. But something is wrong with that, I saw you today in the cafeteria, how you lifted the two of you and those other girls. Part of my quirk gives me a basic understanding of how it works, and with yours right now, I would struggle to move a pencil. Sounds like a problem then, Izuku responded, shrugging his shoulders. Quirks are like a muscle, I was only able to move a pencil when my quirk first manifested. But after some rather intense training, I can use it as I can now, maybe that is the problem. I could be that. It is not something I have necessarily encountered before, but I see your point. I understand your president's quirk, but I lack the knowledge to use it. I know what I need to trigger it. Understandable. Upon entering the council chambers, Izuku felt a chill run down his spine as he noticed Mirio Tagata seated at the front of the room. Beside him was the girl he had encountered on the move-in day who had expressed interest in speaking with him. She possessed long, spiral periwinkle hair, blue eyes, and a shapely figure that drew Izuku's attention. The girl appeared excited upon seeing him, while the boy who had pulled her away during their first encounter stood beside her. This boy was of decent height, with indigo hair, eyes, and pointy ears that gave him an elf-like quality. Unlike their previous meeting, the boy seemed disinterested and would rather be elsewhere. 
A boy with black hair and eyes with a slender build promptly walked over. He introduced himself as the president of 2B Niramoto Show, and his vice president was a pleasant-looking girl with long straight black hair and indigo eyes, Tao Mayumi. 2A's representatives were both female and identical twins at that. They were beautiful with auburn hair and teal eyes, Carrie and Terry. Momo noticed the look the twins gave her and Izuku. Before she could say anything besides hello and introduce herself and Izuku, the meeting was called to order by Mirio. I would first like to welcome our newest student council members. Please introduce yourselves, and we can get this show on the road. After the brief introductions, we, of course, are the third-year representatives, also known as the Big Three. All that means is that we are considered the strongest in the school. Mirio and Izuku locked eyes briefly as Izuku gave him a knowing smirk. I am Mirio Tagata, Class 1B President. This is Nejair Hato, Class 1A President, and Tameki Amajaki, Class 1B Vice President. As if on cue, the door opened, and in walked with reddish hair and red-brown eyes, she was pushing a cart with refreshments and cakes that looked simply divine. This is Yuyu Heya, the class one of Vice. Sorry, I am late. Duncan was putting the finishing touches on the cake, and we got distracted. The girl said with a slight blush. It's okay, Yuyu, I understand, Nejair giggled. Moving on, Mirio said as Tamaki rose, picking up some booklets and walking around to hand them out to the members. This is just the Heroics class representatives. We will meet Thursday in the business course hall to meet with the members of the other councils. What Tamaki is handing you is the handbook for all council members as well as guidelines and rules. I expect you all to read them for our next meeting. You will also find a list of positions that need to be filled in your classes, such as treasurer and secretary. How you choose to do so is up to you. This is all for now. I want us to know each other better and ensure everyone exchanges numbers and joins the group chats. We third years are busy with our work studies, as are the second years, but feel free to contact us if you need any assistance. Please enjoy YUYU's boyfriend's work and let's mingle, Nedjire said as she pumped her fist into the air. YUYU blushed as she set out the teapots and cups. After everyone had grabbed a drink and a bite, everyone talked until they took their first bite and silence filled the room. It was the most amazing thing that anyone had ever eaten. Momo looked over at Izuku with stars in her eyes as she then took a sip of the tea and almost melted into the floor. Izuku darling, you know I love you, but things I would do if the man would cook for me every day make me ashamed. I agree with you, I have never had homosexual thoughts, but I would do whatever he wanted for this food. Momo walked over to YUYU, Heya, you must introduce me to your boyfriend and tell him that my family would love to bankroll any restaurant or that if he would be amenable to being hired as a private chef, he just needs to name his price. This is, divine, why you why you smiled. I will let him know, and thank you, Yayurazu, it is something. Izuku could feel the energy behind him as he turned and faced Nejair Hado. No one can stop me now, so Midoriya, what is your quirk? How do you know my Mirio? Why doesn't he like you? Do you not like him? Why? What did he do? Do I need to punch him? Should I punch you? Do you want to spare some time? Is Yayurazu your girlfriend? If so, how did you meet? Are you into girls? Or maybe boys? Did you try to hit on my boyfriend? Is that what is wrong? Did he hit on you? Does he like boys and not tell me? I told him I like girls. I need to go ask him. She was about to turn and rush off when Izuku lightly placed his hand on her arm, causing her attention back to him. The easiest way to explain my quirk is telekinesis, but there is more to it than that. I met your Mirio one day, and we had a disagreement, and that is why he doesn't like me. No, I am not that fond of him either. I doubt that punching him would do any good. I don't think I need to be punched by you though I did beat your boyfriend during the entrance exam. Maybe you want to punch me for that. I would love to spar with you. Yes, Yayurazu is my girlfriend, we met by chance in town one day. I am very into girls, not boys, and I haven't met one that has sparked that curiosity. I would rather cut out my eyes than hit on our boyfriend, same if he hit on me. I have no idea if he likes boys, and that you like girls too is cool. You answered all my questions and never told me to shut up. That is so awesome. Wait, you beat up Mirio, that is hard to do. We should spare soon. Why was Mirio part of the entrance exam? He didn't tell me that. Why didn't he tell me that? Does this have something to do with this, Mr. Yagi? He is always blowing me off. He has missed date night like 10 times. I don't like it. It doesn't make me feel good. I think those are all answers that you should get from him. All I can say is that if he blew off a date with you, he is dumber than I already believe. I'll ask him, she said confidently as she pivoted towards Mirio and marched over to him. Izuku smiled, but it only seemed to create more trouble for the blonde, who was already dealing with his problems. He decided to move over and join the other representatives in conversation. Meanwhile, the twins had cornered Momo and attempted to set a date with the couple. After some maneuvering, they were able to fend off the twins with the excuse of settling into the start of the school year. Momo smiled and whispered a thank I owe to Izuku as they moved on to talk to the other reps, avoiding a Mirio who looked annoyed at Nejire, who had pulled him aside. You're doing, Momo asked. Slightly, I just told her that if she wanted some answers to some questions that she asked, she should go to the source. He responded. After talking with the other year two reps, they exited as homework and dinner were still on their list to accomplish tonight. 
Upon returning to the dorms, they settled in with their growing group of friends, doing homework and helping them out. It was a pleasant night, primarily bereft of drama. As Izuku and Momo made their way to bed, they slowly slipped into each other's embrace as the night drifted on. Day 4. Izuku and Momo managed to avoid having a repeat of Day 2. The fact that Izuku was downstairs making American omelets for breakfast after Rikido joined him made the process much smoother. Fumikage soon joined them, helping to serve plates and point people to the tea and coffee. The trio were laughing and having a good time, it was enjoyable. They even started to plan what to do the following day. Fumi and Dark Shadow suggested something with apples, their favorite food. After a hearty meal, Izuku ensured his girlfriend was well fed as today was supposed to be some special training. Most of them walked together with little groups clustered together, and the ones that crossed over to other groups pulled people into conversations. It was chaotic and, honestly, much fun. Izuku noticed that Bakugo would orbit but not engage in conversation. Brighton had a group that he seemed to be focused on. Homeroom was brief as they were directed to get into costume and meet at the bus. Izuku and Momo just made sure that everyone boarded, ignoring the seating chart suggestion of Ida, their newly appointed secretary, who smiled and boarded the bus. They were still discussing the position of treasure when the last of their class boarded. They reported to Aizawa as they boarded themselves as the bus began to move. All right, children, we are heading to the unforeseen simulation joint or the USJ for specialized rescue training. Once we arrive, we will be joined by a rescue specialist. I want all of you to give them complete attention and proper respect. No matter what avenue of heroics you go into, you will be involved in rescue operations, so pay close attention. The SSE and SEI rang from his students. Brighton was talking to Achako, sitting next to Tsu when Tsu turned to Brighton. Brighton, I tend to speak my mind. Brighton just looked over at the girl before rolling his eyes and turning his focus back to Achako. So Achako, I was wondering if you had any plans this weekend. His conversation was interrupted by Tsu tapping his shoulder. I am not sure what you did during battle training, but I want you to know I don't like you, and I don't trust you. The bus had quieted down as the conversation caught most of the people's attention. Now Tsu Chan. He responded, Asui, call me Asui. You don't deserve to use my name. Then call me Freedom, you worthless amphibian. Hey, don't talk to her like that. Achako said. The word is worthless reverberated through the bus and made a home in Izuku's ears, DKU. I am sorry, Achako, but we can discuss plans later when others have gone to do whatever they do. Brighton returned to his seat. Achako, I don't have the authority to dictate your company, but please excuse me, Tsu said politely. She then stood up and relocated to sit beside Kayoka, who welcomed her with a gesture. Momo followed suit, sitting in front of them and leaning in to converse with Tsu. Meanwhile, Brighton appeared preoccupied with a hushed conversation with Ida, paying no attention to the situation. Fortunately, the bus arrived outside a massive, doomed building quickly the size of four football fields. The thing was tremendous. Achako's sour mood brightened when she saw her favorite hero, 13, standing outside. Where's All Might? Aizawa said as he stepped off. He is running late. Did you want to wait for him? No, we can get started. We just have to adjust the group sizes till he gets here. 13 nodded her head before stepping forward. Does anyone know what my quirk is? She asked. Achako bounced forward. It is Black Hole. It can absorb anything in its way, you use it to clear rubble in rescue operations. Thirteen nodded, you are correct, it can do that, including people. My quirk is extremely deadly, and I have had to train hard to use it as I do. Some of you have very dangerous and powerful quirks, it is important that you learn how to control them when you are called in on missions like this. That Hugo rolled his eyes and looked away. Not only are we here to train that but to train you how to defend people trapped from villain attacks. Villains love to ambush heroes in these scenarios, especially rescue heroes, so knowing your environment and identifying things that can be used against you is essential. Mr. Bakugo, if you feel this training is beneath you, you can wait on the bus and take the incomplete. Bakugo clicked his tongue but returned his focus to the rescue hero. That goes for any one of you as well, there will be no fighting amongst yourselves today, you will respect your teammates in all the scenarios, if you do not, you will fail. You do not have the luxury of choosing who will be by your side in these operations. I will not let your petty squabbles get in the way of saving lives, nor should you. Am I understood? Yes, S E N S E I. The class responded, even Bakugo, though with little enthusiasm. Good now, follow me. Thirteen motioned as she walked towards the massive doors, and the class fell behind her. As they entered, they could overlook the massive facility. Seeing all the zones, it was truly grand. The class gathered on the landing overlooking the central courtyard and fountain. Now, today we will separate you into different groups. Thirteen started to say. Ijiro was looking over the railing. Mr. A-I-Z-A-W-A, is this part of the simulation? Everyone turned their attention to the portals opening in the courtyard as real villains poured out. There is no way they are real alarms would be going off, said Denki. Eraser head, I have no signal, someone is jamming the communications. Thirteen, get the students out of here and signal for help. Aizawa said, vaulting over the ledge to the ground below. What are you doing? You can't fight them all, not with our quirk. Let me show how it's done. Bakugo yelled after their homeroom teacher. Listen, Bakugo, a true hero, is versatile and can do more than one thing. 
You need to follow Thirteen's orders, or you will be expelled, Aizawa commanded. Suddenly, the leaders appeared from a portal. A peculiar man made of purple smoke with yellow eyes, dressed in slacks and a vest, was accompanied by another man with light blue hair and red eyes, various hands holding onto his body. The final figure to emerge was a hulking creature with a beaked face and exposed brain. Where is all my Kirajiri? He was supposed to be here. The man said in a raspy voice. I do not know, young master. According to the information we obtained, he was supposed to be here. How dare he does not show up to his execution. In the meantime, let's kill some kids until he shows up. Kirajiri, if you would. The rest of you take care of this hobo here. He said with a dismissive hand wave towards a racer head. The smoke man stepped back into a portal. Thirteen was leading the students toward the exit when a black portal opened and out stepped Kirajiri. Stay behind me, children. The rescue hero stepped forward. Denki, can you get a signal through? Momo asked. No, just interference. He responded. Momo looked at Izuku, who nodded. May, Melissa, the Ush is under attack by an unknown amount of villains. The ringleaders are saying something about killing All Might let them know to send back up now. I hear Izuku. I will use the excuse of something about the telemetrics in your and Momo suits. They responded. Children get that door open and escape while I deal with this one. Thirteen commanded as her hand shot forward, the caps on the end of her fingers opening, unleashing her quirk. A portal opened in front of her attack, and a second opened behind her tearing open Thirteen's suit, and the hero screamed in pain. Bakugo and Ijiro yelled and leaped at the villain, only to be swallowed by a portal. Suddenly portal erupted all around the students, Izuku pulled himself away and was doing the same to Momo when suddenly he felt a shove in his side and was knocked into the swirling darkness. Brighton smirked as Izuku and most other students were swallowed. He pulled Momo away from the portal that sought to consume her and sent Itsuka in her place, not that anyone would know. He managed to pull Momo, Hachako, Hitoshi, and Ida safely out of harm's way, now to deal with this portal villain, save Thirteen, and hope that Izuku was adequately dealt with. He would gain allies, and Momo would swoon right into his arms. Perfect. He loved it when a plan came together perfectly, even if it had to be improvised. The door. One moment Izuku was next to her. The next, he was swallowed by the strange portals that had appeared everywhere, taking the rest of the class. It took her a second to notice that Brighton was holding her arm. He had pulled her away. Achako, Hitoshi, Ida, and Thirteen had been spared. It seems that some of you managed to avoid my dispersal. Interesting. It doesn't matter. Your fates are sealed, the mist villain said. We need to get that door open, Ida yelled. Very foolish hero to be announcing your plans right before me. You, children, will trouble us no more. Why are you doing this? Hitoshi said, stepping in front of the group. Because, gotcha, you son of a bitch, Hitoshi said with a grin. Now stand there and do nothing. Everyone froze as the villain became perfectly still. No one touches him, it will break him free, he said. Achako ran towards Thirteen pulling some bandages from her pouch. Momo set a taser next to her. If he breaks free, shoot him in the neck brace. There has to be something under there, or else why to have it? She said, looking at the others, Come on, we need to open that door, Hitoshi, can you make him open a portal? No, that requires higher brain functions, the boy responded. Quickly she created two crowbars and handed them over to Ida and Hitoshi, See if you can wedge that under the door to get it up some while I create a hydraulic lift to get up enough for Ida to run for help. Brighton, get to the control booth and see if you can find a manual override or a way to send a signal for help. Ida went to protest, but Hitoshi grabbed him by the arm door first, man. Brighton wanted to protest. She hadn't even thanked him for saving her, but he knew now was not the time. Instead, he broke for the stairs leading to the control room. I am going to see if there is a manual unlock mechanism. He yelled. Momo, I don't know if 13 will make it, Achako said. Just keep doing what you are doing, Achako, and keep an eye on that bastard so he doesn't hit us in the back. We need to get the doors open. Flood zone. Denki was falling from the sky as his vision cleared after being consumed by the black portal. He saw water and a group of villains waiting for him. He thrust his arm out. 5k discharge. He shouted. His attack, normally unfocused and hard to use, was well suited in a wide open area. The villains had a moment for panic to cross their eyes as the electricity hit the water, causing them to scream in pain before they passed out. Denki braced for impact when suddenly a long tongue wrapped around his waist pulled him towards the ship in the lake. Looking over his shoulder, he saw Tsu pulling him in. Nice catch, Tsu. He shouted. Good shooting, Denki. Thankfully, I was out of the water when that hit. She called back. He saw Koji giving a thumbs up behind her. As he landed a bit roughly, do you have any idea where anyone else is? Hiro. She asked. No, I didn't have a chance to look. All I saw was those villains looking like they would eat me. He responded. No other class members are in the area, Koji said. I have animals looking for the others. It is obvious they don't know our quirks, Ribbit, Sue said. Yay, you're right. Why else send me and you here, Denki said, smacking his hands hands together. The villains are regrouping, Koji said. How big of a shock can you do? Hiro. Sue asked Denki. Why? If we stay here, they are going to sink the boat, and that means you can't fight without hurting us, so we need to get out of here quickly. I can do a pretty big shock but leave me out of it as it fries my brain. Throw him, Koji said. You and I throw him into the air, he fires off his attack. 
You grab him, and we get to shore. The other two looked at their usually silent friend. Dude, that is metal. I like it, Kiro. All right, Operation Lightning Dart is a go. Koji flashed a thumbs up. The villains saw a student thrown off the boat as they planned their attack. The last thing they heard was 1.3 million indiscriminate shock. Mountain Zone. Kayoka saw rocks approaching at an accelerated rate. All she could do was try and brace for impact when Itsuka came leaping out of nowhere, grabbing her as she tumbled sideways. My, what big strong hands you have, Kayoka groaned as she got to her feet. All the better to catch you, my dear, Itsuka responded with a similar groan. Look what they gave us. How nice, I want the redhead, a weak voice rang out, grabbing their attention. The girls looked as if they were semi-surrounded by villains. The one who spoke had a sickly-looking frame with diseased splotches on his skin. Whatever, just make sure you don't kill her like the others. A villain that looked like he crawled out of a sewer said. I want to dance with the rocker chick, we will make such beautiful music together, said another with a white ruffled shirt and black leather pants. Kayoka and Itsuka took their fighting stances, ready to fight with all they had. As the group of men went to advance suddenly over a rock formation, Mizo leaped out and fired two good-sized boulders, striking the sick boy and sewer in the head and knocking them out. I don't think the ladies are interested in dancing with you, gentlemen. He landed near the girls. Dude, that was sick, Kayoka said with a smile. Now let's kick their asses, Itsuka shouted as she rushed in, with Mizo and Kayoka on her heels. Windstorm zone. Fumikage stepped into the middle of the street, his anger and control slipping through his fingers as if he was trying to hold water. The mocking taunts of the villains, their complaints at only a boy being sent to them, one not complaining about being sent a boy but wishing Fumi was younger. They talk of how they wanted to spread out to the other zones to partake of his classmates after they were done with him. You are done for, you just haven't realized it, he said, his voice too quiet for them to hear. Dark Shadow unleashed the Black Parade. The roar of Dark Shadow was heard across the USJ. The rain and wind consumed the screams of the villains, their blood was washed down the drains. Landslide Zone. Shoto landed using an ice slide to slow his descent. Quickly, he took in the scene around him. A female scream above him signaled that he wasn't alone. He is the telltale gloves and boots of Toru as she fell. Springing into action, he created a slide to bring her to his side while erecting a wall between them and the villains. I got you, Toru. Are you okay? Catching her at the bottom of the slide and pulling her to his side. Thanks for the save, Shoto. What will we do? Toru said, thankful he couldn't see her blush as he held her close. I want you to get behind me and stay close so I don't accidentally hurt you. I am going to end this in one move. He moved from her side to his back, keeping his hand on her waist, holding her close to his body. As the wall fell, the villains sneered and began to case jeers. Shoto eyes narrowed, and he stomped the ground, all the villains were instantly encased in ice. His right side flared slightly as he did his best to keep Toru warm. He approached the first villain and freed his head. Frostbite can occur in less than 15 minutes. Now tell me about your plan to kill All Might, and you may get to keep your extremities. Shoto glanced down at the man's crotch. Even your most important one. Tora felt it was extreme, but she couldn't help but feel that Shoto was so damn cool, pun intended. Fire Zone. Katsuki and Ijiro came through, falling into a fiery hellscape. Ijiro hardened as he crashed into a building to lessen the damage. Katsuki used his explosions to slow himself down. He landed with a smirk as the villains came out to surround them. There is no way these fuckers have any idea what our quirks are. Katsuki thought. You good, Bikabro? Oh, I am fucking fantastic these assholes will not know what hit them. Try to keep up shitty hair. I will do my best not to leave you behind. Bakugo began sweating furiously from the heat. A wicked grin spread across his face. Forest zone. Rikido crashed through the trees. As he hit the ground, he felt the wind forced out of him. It took a moment to get his bearings then he felt a sharp pain in his side. Looking, there was good-sized branch impaled through him. Ridding his teeth, he broke off the protruding edges and wrapped his midsection using bandages. It was the sound of something flying towards him that caught his attention. Quickly, he rolled to his side despite the pain, grabbing a sugar pack and pouring the contents into his mouth. The makeshift projectile missed its target. A person with a gorilla quirk burst through the brush and collided with Rikido, its mighty arms threw him back and into a clearing. Rikido rolled to his feet, allowing him to slip a monstrous hook, grab the offending appendage, and hurl the villain into a large boulder, he followed it up with a sliding knee to the villain's head. There was a sickening cracking sound as it was trapped between the boulder and his knee, Rikido rose to his feet in horror, only for his shoulder to explode in pain as a gunshot echoed through the forest. He collapsed and scrambled around the boulder seeking some cover. He looked over the rock to see a man dressed in a black duster with a black skull mask dragging a severely battered and bloodied Yuga. Come out, hero, or your friend dies. Ruin zone. Mina was panting heavily, and her fist rocketed forward, toppling the villain back, ready to press her advantage. Her foot landed heavily in the man's crotch. No means no, you ask goblin. She yelled. Sometimes it means try harder. A chilling rasp of a voice came from the shadows. Mina spun, throwing acid in the direction of the vote. A chilling laugh echoed throughout the room, and suddenly a sharp pain exploded from her back. 
She fell forward, feeling the blood rush out. She wildly sprayed her acid at the shadows. Try harder, my pretty. The voice taunted. Mina was living through a horror film, trying to locate her attacker only to be cut from another angle. Her arms and thighs bore the signs of her battle as she lay panting on her knee. Her heart was pounding as fear took over her actions, causing her to flail wildly. Her breathing was getting labored, her vision was darkening, and she realized she was poisoned. She saw her nightmare emerge from the floor. It was this grotesque half-man half-spider kind of creature. It seemed to melt out of the shadows, its body and was all an unnatural black color with ghostly white hair. Dried her from DND it reached out and grabbed her roughly from her by her arms. Hoisting her into the air, she felt something sticky cover her wrists. She was thrown against the wall and suspended there. She managed to look up and saw what looked to be a spider web holding her wrist together and keeping her to the wall. This thing looked at her like it had won and that it would claim her body as its prize. This motherfucker thinks he will lay his hand on this alien queen. She began to build up her acid in the most substantial pH. She could. Usually, she held back as not wanting to do permanent damage, but this son of bitch was trying to claim her body, and no motherfucker would take that from her. She slumped, giving the appearance that she was defeated, she heard the thing laugh. She just waited, that laughter would turn into ashes in its mouth. Volcano Zone. Izuku appeared through the portal after the distinct feeling of being shoved. Quickly, he looked around, not seeing Momo. He reached out telepathically only to find a barrier in the area. Looking down, he saw two people standing there looking up at him, a boy and a girl. The boy was about Izuku's age with black hair and colorless eyes. His skin had a light brown tone, with his ethnicity had a hint of European with something else. The girl looked to be his relative, but she was younger by a few years. She had light brown highlights with pale green eyes giving them an almost ghostly appearance. They were both beautiful and carried them with confidence and purpose. Izuku gently lowered himself to the ground. Walk away. The boy stepped forward. Strange white energy sparked around his fists. Sorry lad, you must be daft if you think we came all this way to just leg it when you showed up. The girl smiled sweetly. Father would be most displeased if we were to do so. Izuku shrugged, pulling up a telekinetic shield. The boy pushed off the ground, leaving a dive. Izuku went to reach out and grab him like he had done Mirio. But to his surprise, his attack was pushed wide by another telekinetic strike. The boy slid under the energy trail as if he could see it. His fist impacted the shielding. Izuku expected the shield to hold. To his surprise, the attack passed right through, and when it first moved, it reminded Izuku of when he fought the World Devourer. The impact sent Izuku flying back into the volcano behind him. He could barely roll out of the way of the leaping down strike that followed after him. He went to create some distance only to get grabbed and tossed telekinetically, orienting himself. He saw the boy leap into the air and spring off a floating platform as he met Izuku in the air, his punch landing against Izuku's head. The boy spun up on Izuku's shoulders. He landed a glowing axe handle smash sending the boy crashing back towards the ground, only to meet violently with a telekinetic pillar smashing into his back. The boy's feet planted against another platform as he launched down with all his strength, I expected better, little phoenix. The control room. Brighton sat there relaxed, sitting safely in the control room, the room was powered down. There was nothing he could do but look for a manual override for the door. In truth, he found it a few minutes ago. Watching from the view window, he could see them struggling with the door and this homeroom teacher fighting a rising tide of villains. All the while, the ones that were the leader did nothing, the hulking beast hadn't so much as twitched a muscle. Seeing that his chosen group had managed to start making headway on the door, he flipped the manual override switch, ever one to add to his glory. He turned and headed for the door when it burst open, and embarged a woman with technicolor hair, she was dressed in a white body suit that hugged her ample figure. Following her was a man with red hair and black eyes, dressed in rags that smelled awful. The group locked eyes as the woman's hair grew brighter, and the lights came racing out at him. From the man, the rags began to expand and encompass the room. Brighton smiled as time slowed to a crawl. He positioned himself away from the woman's attack and punched Ragman, returning time to normal flow. The man flew back into the wall from the force of the blow as the woman's attack exploded the viewing window. He slowed once again to close the distance to the Ragman as he rebounded off the wall to deliver a leaping knee to the man's face. Deactivating his quirk, he appeared to teleport. The real secret was that as time reaccelerated, it pulled on Brighton and added velocity to his attacks. The woman whirled to strike, only to suddenly find herself flying out the broken window. Achako could only watch in horror as the woman flew out of the booth and crashed into the mist villain. The door. The door mechanism started to release as Momo and the boys got the hydraulic jack in the opening they had forced open. Ida, you got to go, Momo shouted. The sounds of explosions, screams, and a dreadful roar could be heard all over the USJ. They turned as the glass from the control exploded, Ida nodded, pressing himself through the opening he ran. Stay alive, my friends, please stay alive. Ida engaged his quirk running with all his might to find help. Support course. You don't understand their telemetric spiked when the signal was lost. Our signal is being jammed, the only way to do that is if someone is actively doing it. They yelled for the fifth time. Sensei, please just send back up to the USJ, Melissa said, something is wrong. Power Loader had tried to convince the two students that they were overreacting, but they seemed desperate. 
Pulling out his phone, he attempted to raise a racer head or 13 only to be met with static. When he tried to boost the signal and couldn't raise them, he immediately signaled Nezu telling him of the problem. Power Loader then attempted to access the security cameras to find them all offline. This time he hit the alarm. Now, I have been trying to talk to Izuku, and nothing. Same may, same. What is happening over there? Edge of the flood zone. Denki was in his own world as Koji pulled him to shore. Tsu rose out of the water, the trio creeping through the foliage. They came upon their sensei fighting for his life. I don't think we can do anything, Koji whispered. Not with Denki this way, we need to get him over to the plaza and the exit, Tsu said. 24, 22, 21, 18. They heard the man with the wild blue hair and hands counting, his quirk is slowing down. He can't keep it up. Namu crushes this annoying NPC. They watched in horror as the hulking beast stood there for one moment. The next, it had punched their sensei in the gut, blood flying past his signature scarf. Mountain Zone. Kayoka was trying to stop Mizo from bleeding from the stab wound to the gut. All the girl could do was keep applying pressure, they had barely managed to pull him back from the bear villain. Kayoka couldn't even accurately account for the boy's wounds, his arm on the left side were broken, and he was missing a hand or two. Kayoka herself had been stabbed in the shoulder and suffered numerous other cuts from the woman with six arms and as many swords. She had white eyes and hair, and the way she moved was like she was dancing, a dancing spinning dervish of death. Itsuka stood there, her classmates behind her, one was critically injured, the other in danger of bleeding out from all the wounds. Itsuka was not in good shape, with multiple cuts and one arm hanging limply at her side, as the bear and dervish smirked at them. About fifteen other villains were unconscious or out of commission, but they were cannon fodder. These two were the ones in charge. Sadly, she saw some of that mere cannon fodder getting to their feet. Kayoka, can you run? She said over her shoulder. I will not leave you, Itsuka, or Mizo, he is still bleeding. He won't make it if I don't hold this wound. We can only hope that they just kill us, right? Then we will go down together, Hitsuka. You have all fought nobly. I swear that your deaths will be quick, and your virtue will be intact, the dervish said. Yay, I am just going to eat you red, you look delish, the bear said, licking its chops. Suddenly the sky behind the villains was filled with darkness, dark shadow to be exact, and it didn't appear to be in control. Landslide zone. Shoto and Toru were escaping from the zone when dark shadow emerged from the windstorm zone. I don't like the look of that, Toru said, holding on to the heterochromatic teen as they moved via ice sled. They saw their classmates' troubled state as they entered the mountain zone. They could hear the screams as Dark Shadow approached the group, and villains were tossed like plastic toys before a giant toddler. They could see none of the usual sense of intelligence that generally accompanied the sentient quirk. I fear he can't tell friend from foe, we need to get to the others. I am going to jump and take that sword bitch down from the air, Toru said as her gloves and boots flew. Shoto turned them to descend to their critically injured classmates. He and Toru leaped from the ice slide, with Shoto sending an ice pillar at the bear. It also attracted the attention of the dervish, who turned to face him, of course not being able to see the invisible rocket that crashed into her chest. Toru had leaped and impacted the woman, her knees hitting the woman in the shoulders, driving her to the ground, her head thudding. The bear was quite more agile than Shoto thought as it dodged the ice pillar and rushed Shoto. He tried to avoid the villain but was caught in a crushing bear hug. Shoto knew that his classmates were in danger and couldn't encase himself and the villain in ice. It is my fire, people may die. Can I live with them dying because I refuse to use everything at my disposal? No, the thing about fur is that it can be flammable, Shoto said as his left side erupted in a violent flame. The bear's coat caught instantly, and he dropped Shoto, who rolled away, dousing his flame side as the beast ran and fire off into the USJ. Fire zone. The villains had a lousy day. Katsuki, with unlimited sweat, meant more prominent and better explosions. Those that didn't get blown to kingdom come were introduced to a rock fist. As the duo raced out of the fire zone, they saw Dark Shadow explode up and begin tossing villains. Katsuki immediately noticed that the quirk was not in its right mind, significantly when it lifted and tossed a car at them. Katsuki rocketed to the side as Ijiro barely managed to follow suit. The goddamn bird motherfucker is throwing cars at me. Bird face must have lost control, goddamn shitty extras. Yo shitty hair, I am going to go say hello to Tweety you find bird's face and see if you can smack some sense into him. If not, knock him the fuck out. Got it. Katsuki rocketed off, landing before Dark Shadow. Hey, Tweety. Dark Shadow roared in response and doved down at Katsuki, to which the boy smiled and raised one of his gauntlets braced the best he could, pulling the pin that stored all the sweat he had accumulated during his fight in the fire zone. The explosion rocked the entire USJ and blew part of the glass roof apart. Dark Shadow reared back as the light and sound severely damaged the sentient quirk. Ijiro found Fumi, who was cackling madly, so Ijiro did precisely what he was told. He reared back and smacked his classmate. Dark Shadow recoiled from not only the explosion but the blinding flash, forcing it to decrease in size severely, but then when Fumi was brought back to reality, it could feel the blind rage subsiding. Fumi found himself on his backside, looking up at Ijiro as the redhead team talked, trying to help bring Fumi back into control. Katsuki leaped at Dark Shadow, firing off more explosions targeting the shadow but not at it, using the light from the blast to weaken it further so Fumi could try and rein it in. Forest Zone 
Rikido frantically looked around, hoping to find some weapon. All he could see was a fist-sized rock. Grabbing it with his good arm, he clutched it to his chest. His arm was bleeding from the gunshot, his side from the impaled tree branch, and his struggle with the gorilla. His time and options were limited. He didn't know what condition Yuga was in, but he knew from what he saw that it was not good. Odds were that they would die from their wounds without medical attention. He was terrified. Here he was in the first week of hero training, and he knew that he was about to die if he did nothing and only had a slim chance of surviving even if he did something. He closed his eyes and silently prayed to the cosmos and his parents, asking them to forgive him. He needed an opening, if he surrendered, they were both dead. Suddenly the building was rocked by an insane explosion. Rikido dumped a sugar packet into his mouth, fueling his quirk. As he broke cover, the man immediately fired a shot. It went errant, striking the boulder Rikido had just broken cover from. The young hero in training reared back and threw the rock with all his strength as a second shot rang out, hitting him in the leg and sending him to the ground. The man shifted slightly to his side, but the rock still impacted his shoulder with a sickening crack causing him to drop Yuga. He tried to move forward to press his advantage, but his leg collapsed. Frantically trying to claw his way toward the villain, he saw the man getting to his knee and raising the gun. Rikido's mind frantically raced, but he knew he was done for. Suddenly as the villain was about to fire, Yuga dove at him, striking him in the head. The broken and battered lad struggled to his feet frantically as he grabbed the villain's head and held it to his navel. Murder Tom Erd, he said as he fired off a blast straight through the villain's head, killing him. Yuga wobbled as he locked eyes with Rikido, desperately as the villain's lifeless body fell to the ground. He managed to stumble a few steps towards his classmate. His blonde hair stained crimson, blood pouring down his face, c'est magnifique, he muttered as he collapsed to the ground. Rikido tried to drag himself, only for the same fate to befall him as the pain and blood loss overtook him. Ruin zone. Nina stood over the form of once her would-be rapist, his dying scream still echoing in the room, the smell of melted flesh permeating her nose. She looked at her stinging skin, tattered hero outfit and stepped over the still-melting mass with a shrug. She stumbled out of the room, she had to escape. She would not be caught here again, this was not how she would end. Once she hit the ruined streets, she willed her legs into motion, determined that she would survive this hell. As she rounded the corner to the streets, she saw that she wasn't alone, villains, more of them. They turned and locked eyes with the pink-skinned girl, looks of unspeakable horrors were sent her way, it didn't have the effect they desired. Mina had already stared that down up close, had already used her acid in a way that had and would fuel her nightmares. In for a penny and for a pound, Mina muttered. She may fall today but would not fall without taking as many of these bastards down as she could. Volcano Zone I expected better, little phoenix. Izuku's eyes suddenly changed as the boy rocketed towards him, gone were the emeralds. Green orbs soon exploded in a brilliant yellow fire as the cosmic power roared to life in his veins. Stabilizing himself, he caught the boy's fist in his, and the energy surrounding the boy's hand hurt. He could feel the point tearing into his very cells, tearing at the phoenix force that ran through his veins. His mind firing, he quickly threw a psychokinetic assault at the girl that sent her tumbling back as thin cuts exploded all over her body as she was being cut at a molecular level. Not little phoenix, just phoenix, he said and crushed the boy's hand with his newly increased strength. The power cosmic rushed to the call as he drove a knee into the boy's stomach, cut off his scream of pain, and threw him into the ground from above, leaving a massive crater. The girl tried desperately attacking telekinetically, but Izuku batted the attacks aside. For being so young, you are so talented. But whoever sent you didn't quite understand whom they were sending you against. He snapped his fingers, and more lacerations exploded from the girl as the boy yelled an empty threat Izuku threw his bleeding sister into him. He dove down, crashing into them and kicking them down the mountainside. He stalked after them when he felt the psychic shielding in the area collapse. The emotions and thoughts of his classmates flooded him, he staggered back, sifting through it all. He turned to look at his opponents. The girl was down, the boy's hand was broken, and he more than likely had other wounds. Tell whoever sent you to stay the hell away. Ruin zone. The villains were too deep into the sunk cost fallacy at this point. This girl had critically injured over half of them, half of whom had fled, leaving the remaining few with just a sense of bloodlust. Not even a week after attending UA. This child stood defiantly, bleeding, and half-naked. Her words were slurred, one eye bruised, a horn broken, a head wound, as she stumbled, only being held up the wall at her back. Not trusting her voice, she motioned for them to come at her. She couldn't dodge, she had to keep standing, she had to keep fighting. Her acid was barely coming out anymore, everything hurt, and she was only aware of her extremities because she could visually account for them. When a villain suddenly broke open a fire hydrant, and the water dragon crashed into her, she could barely hold her breath, another rushed in her, his body covered in tiny spikes. He wrapped her to his body. She screamed as dozens of points invaded her body, freeing her hand, she dug her thumbs into his eyes, managing to secrete some acid from them as she did so. He stumbled back, screaming and clawing his eyes. The third woman touched a piece of rubble. It rocketed at Mina, who barely managed to get her arms in front of her to block. The impact fractured her left arm. The fourth came in behind the attack to deliver a vicious punch to her gut, driving what little wind she had from her body. 
He then went a knee into her, throwing her back into the wall like a rabid animal. Mina grabbed onto the leg and bit deep into his thigh, her acidic saliva adding to the attack. His scream's halting attack made Mina drive her fist into his balls, toppling him. The final attacker came from the side and crashed a brick into the side of her head as she toppled over. She tried to stand only to topple again, turning, she saw them stalking her. She felt a kick land on her already damaged ribs as she was on all fours. Her brain couldn't even register the pain as her body was experiencing too much already. She was on her back as the one who smashed the brick to her head straddled her torso, in what she assumed would be her final act of defiance. She concentrated as much acid and at as high of pH. As she could in her mouth when he opened his mouth to talk, she spit right in his filthy mouth. He screamed and fell off her as acid began to eat at his throat and dissolve his esophagus. She managed a small laugh as the water dragon man stood over her. They struggle less when they are dead, he said wickedly. That or it's because your PP is so small, they can't tell if you are in, she retorted. She wouldn't cry, she wouldn't beg, and she wouldn't give them that satisfaction. Mina Ashido fought 21 villains that day, alone, and in the end. Only three were walking away unharmed. The rest, if they lived, were going to be scared the rest of their lives. Imagine what I could have done with two weeks of training. Sorry, Mum, sorry, Dad. The screams brought her back to reality. She saw the three villains float into the air, their arms and legs twisting and breaking as they crashed back into the ground. She could smell cinnamon. She saw Izuku come down next to her. I have you, Mina, it's okay. The door. Itoshi ran carrying 13. Her gravity was negated, thanks to Achako trying to get her out of the facility. The mist villain opened a portal in front of him. He managed to dive to the side to avoid being sucked in. Momo slipped an item to Achako, neck brace, she said. Momo spun to the side as a blast of technicolor light exploded next to her. Rushing the villain metal bat in hand, she ran forward, coming in a perfect standing slide. Twisting her hips and putting her all into her swing a satisfying metal clang rang out as the bat struck true to the villain's head and sickening squelch followed. Achako rushed towards the mist villain dodging right to avoid a portal, as she did so, another appeared. She attempted to plant a juke back to prevent the second portal. She thought she wasn't going to make it when time seemed to slow down. She avoided the exit and crossed the remaining distance, slapping the piece of C4 to the metal brace and brushing her finger pads across the metal surface as time seemed to catch up to her. The mist villain couldn't even react as he was sent flying away through the air. Achako dived for cover. Momo whirled around to see Misty barreling away. She pulled out a detonator, fuck you. She spits as she triggers the explosion. Plaza. Namu had crushed a razor head's arm, and with a mighty kick, he sent the pro flying to be embedded in a wall. Tamira watched all this, wondering where Kirajiri was when he saw him fly through the air and explode. What the fuck? He shouted. Namu, go kill whoever is by the door. Door. Achako ran over towards Momo as she was about to move. It all slowed down again as the monstrous being landed between them. It was a hulking beast with a beak where its mouth should be, and its brain exposed. Neither girl could react when it swung its mighty arm colliding flush with Achako's chest, sending her flying, and its other arm snatched Momo off the ground with the other. Brighton slowed time and rushed in, as he moved, his eyes widened when he saw the beast's eyes track him. He couldn't stop himself when the beast swung its free arm sending the boy over the ledge towards the plaza. In a flash, two of her classmates had been dealt with. Momo managed to swing her bat to no effect as it harmlessly collided with the beast. Her windpipe quickly was collapsing under this thing's monstrous strength when out of desperation. She created a stiletto blade and stabbed it through its eye. The thing roared and dropped the creation user to the ground, and with a mighty kick, he punted her away her ribs breaking and blood erupting from her mouth. Achako pushed herself up and ran towards the beast, slapping it on the back as it whirled around, the blade pushing itself out as the creature regenerated. She could block as the thing beat her away again, sending her tumbling across the ground. Sue and company managed to arrive at this most dangerous moment. Thankfully, Denki seemed to be returning to his senses. Sue used her tongue to grab the thing and throw it back towards the plaza. Koji activated his quirk now that the dome was open to the outside. Summoning all the birds he could, Phlox dived into the USJ, dive-bombing the villains in the plaza. He ran towards Momo only to see her vomit more blood. As the girl was gasping for air, blood was frothing from her mouth. Brighton landed in the middle of the cannon fodder. When his quirk deactivated, they turned and began to pounce. His ability to slow time was fading from usage. He managed to avoid some blows as others rained down, and he made it to the steps seeing Denki at the top he grabbed the boy and threw him as time reasserted its dominance. Denki had got to the top of the stairs the next thing he knew, he was airborne. The familiarity of this was not lost on him from his arrival to the flood zone, but he was sure that Sue wouldn't be able to save him this time. Fuck it. 1.3 million indiscriminate shock. He yelled. The assembled villains yelled as the electricity raced through them. Once again, his mind down, Denki landed with a thud in the middle of the down group way. The racer head freed himself as Tamura raced towards him, activating his quirk again. The villain was stunned when his hand landed on the pro's face, and nothing happened. Aizawa quickly understood that the villain's quirk must rely on five-finger contact. He smashed his fist into the stunned boy's face, sending him tumbling away. Quickly using his capture scarf, he wrapped it around his broken arm to stabilize it. 
The Namu reached the wall that pushed off like a missile back to the group by the door. Sue threw Ochako to the side and attempted to leap back when the thing impacted the ground, its hand snatching her out of the air and slamming her down to the ground. Noma was drowning in her blood, her ribs had punctured her lungs, and she was dying. Koji was over her fretting, trying to stop the blood loss, but he could do nothing. May and Melissa screamed as the telemetry reading for Mizuku and Momo's suit suddenly sprang to life, and they saw the critical condition alert for Momo. Shoto's group arrived to see Tsu being slammed, he quickly sprang into action. Freezing the monster's limbs in place, Tora ran to see if she could free Tsu from the monster's grasp. Grabbing a metal bat she saw on the floor, she swung with all her might, bringing it down on the thing's hand. She did her best not to retch as it shattered effortlessly, dropping the bat, she grabbed the frog girl trying to pull her to safety. Bakugo was airborne when he saw Shoto freeze the beast, and their sensei kicked the hand freak back. He figured Icy Hot could handle it for now. Instead, he rocketed toward the son of bitch that thought he could kill All Might. Brighton stumbled to his feet to see the monster break free, leaving its frozen limbs behind. He watched in disgust as they started to regenerate. When the thing looked at him, he knew that significant injury was sure to follow, if not death. Using his quirk again, which caused blood to seep from his ears and nose, he put the damn frog girl and what he guessed was the invisible girl between them. When the beast ran through them, trampling them to the ground, Brighton used the momentary slowdown to jump to the plaza below. The beast whirled, seeing the group of injured students by the door with a thing that had frozen it between it and them. It blurred forward, Shoto managed to create an ice shield and brace, which probably saved his life, and he went tumbling across the ground. Itsuka using her uninjured arm, swung for all she was worth, she might have well as spit on it for all it seemed to react. It grabbed the girl and began to strangle her when Kayoka jammed her jacks into its exposed brain and pumped her raging heartbeat directly into it. Koji called every animal he could to try to distract this thing. Shoto struggled to his feet, almost everyone was down, thankfully, when the Namu swung at Kayoka, Hijiro had managed to arrive and block the attack, but Shoto noticed the cracks that formed on the boy's hardened arms. Bakugo fired off his explosion, driving the hand freak back, he ignored the shouts of Eraser Head to fall back as he spun through the air to deliver a devastating blast, only for the monster to slide under the explosion, his fingertips grazing Bakugo's gauntlet. He watched in terror as it began to decay, in a panic, he tried to get the thing off his arm, losing sight of his opponent, only to feel a hand grab his face. Then nothing happened. You are just so cool, aren't you, Eraser Head, the villain spat. Bakugo's mind immediately snapped back, placing his hand against the villain's chest, blasted with everything he could, sending the hand freak flying around and his hands going everywhere. The Namu swung again and again, and Ijiro was driven down to one knee. Shoto fired spikes of ice to see a black portal appear, swallowing them suddenly. He immediately tried to cancel his quirk and visit another portal open behind all the wounded and a scream died in his throat when he saw them all impact a telekinetic shield. Izuku landed near the wounded with Mina. Izuku extended his hand toward the beast. Everyone looked in horror as it lifted into the air and was disassembled. As he stalked forward, his costume was different, blood red trimmed in gold, a dark red, the almost black fire began to emanate from him as he crept forward. Izuku, it was whispered, gurgled almost inaudible over everything, but Kayoka heard it. It was Momo. Kayoka ran over to the girl as Hitoshi ran in and grabbed Sue and Toru to pull them back towards the door. Momo saw what was happening and knew she needed to stop it. She tried to call out to him and saw the signs that this was the Dark Phoenix and the world was about to burn. Kayoka was at her side, holding her hand. What about Izuku? The punk rock girl asked. Burn, Phoenix. Anchor, Momo, I don't understand. Izuku, save me, tell, Momo managed as more blood poured. Izuku, Momo is dying. You need to save her. She shouted, and she saw the boys stop. Please, Izuku, the others are hurt, and some are dying as well. Save us, save Momo. Flashback. Jean, can the Phoenix Force heal as well? The entity grants us the power to control life and death. We can empty a living being from its life force to redistribute it, bathe someone in it so she can heal, or even heal, resurrect another being. This power is linked to the phoenix's ability to return from the dead. The firebird is immortal. Burn bright little phoenix and bathe them in your fire. Flashback end. He extended his senses all across the USJ, sensing those two dying in the forest, Mizo who was clinging to life, the wound and damage to all his classmates, Tora's heart slowing from when she was stomped, Tsu body temp dropping from blood loss, Hitsuka standing because her heart hadn't given out yet, Ijiro's broken arms but he was still trying to defend others, Eraser head and Thirteen's myriad of injuries, and lastly Momo pleading with him psychically to come back. Not to save her, but to come back to her, to not burn the world as he was about to, to keep their classmates. Nowhere was she pleading for her life. She was still trying to save him. The class gathered there and watched his clothing change to normal before a white fire erupted everywhere around them. They felt the worst of their wounds heal, their strength return, and a warmth and sense of life that empowered their very souls. They all felt connected for a moment, they all felt like one. The injured rose to their feet, and the nearly dead stood again. Shigaraki roared in frustration, looking for the hands that once covered his body. 
He saw them fall through portals as Kurajiri appeared at his side. Master, we must flee, the Namu is dead, the others we have brought are decimated. I will not run. Kurajiri didn't ask again, a portal opening up as they fell in. The faculty arrived a few seconds later to see Class 1 looking like they had been through hell. Seeing their teachers come, many collapsed into tears and sank to the floor. They had survived, barely, though the worst of their wounds had been healed somehow by Izuku they still bore the marks of their fight, and they would have the mental scars to prove it. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through What If Abande and Deku Got Harim. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Lestat719 for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Deku Fanfic for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.